what sort of creation did you have for lunch today? I had some I leftover saw, taco stuff. You know, you do the random taco leftover bowl pretty frequently. That's Heck pretty. Yeah. That's a staple for you because you can make it. In do you guys do tacos quantities. every week? It's a, it's a, it's a go-to. Yeah. Like for me, it's probably every. Everybody other week. in the family likes it, so it's like. It's yeah. a sure bet. It is a ton of work, though, man. Yeah. Literally, I started cooking it last night at 6.30. Wait, tacos? Yeah. How are tacos a ton of work? Oh, you just got brown beef. Well, we go all out, man. Yeah, it's a whole process. Did you make your own shells? No, no. But we cut up, like, we often will cut up mango. We do mango? tomatoes. Mango is a game what? changer. Oh, my yeah. God. No, but I'm you don't just... like sweet meats, though. No, no, I don't. No, but mango? I mean, we just do the ground beef, the cheese, and lettuce. Sometimes black olives. No, doesn't you gotta understand Rachel, like she loves tacos. I, well, I know she's a nacho lady. She's a nacho lady, she's a taco lady. Oh, okay. So we go, we we it's a whole thing. There's like at least a dozen bowls of things that it happens. What? It's like a whole buffet kind of a thing. Yeah. Yeah. We don't mess around when it comes to tacos. Oh my god. No wonder you always have so much leftovers. Well, I make it because it takes a while to make, but it's like I can just throw a couple extra pounds of meat in there and just make it a couple more extra quantity. pounds? Yeah, like if we're <laughs> yeah. Because you, you, I mean, how many, how much do you need for four people for one meal? Like a pound of meat? I don't know. Yeah. But I'll often make like three pounds of meat. Because we do black, we do black beans, pinto beans, and then rice with a jar of salsa. Cook all that in a pan. And often like red peppers, you know. Dang, too. you were right. You do not yeah. mess. So cook all that together oh, in a wow. pan. And that's like the mixture. And then we have cilantro. We do avocado, mango, tomatoes, cheese, lime juice, all that stuff. Yeah. See, I'm just like, like I just buy hard shells. I just buy the El Paso box. No and way, I've man. got the packet. It's a whole. The, it's a whole routine. So we started at six thirty last night. By the time we cooked, ate, and I did all the dishes, it was eight ten. So I was like, yeah, this is kind of a lot. And I had help too, with the kids. The kids helped me out a lot, and it was like, okay. This is uh, this is a lot of time. I don't know. Serious taco business. So that's man. why when we do it, I'm gonna do a lot of it, and yeah. I'm gonna like I'm having tacos like all week for lunch. You know. Wow. Anyway, there you go. I know this isn't even like in the segment, but it's like oh, well, we're recording, whatever. so we'll it might sprinkle it in. It might be. Oh, like a three minute pre roll to the video. Why not learn <laughs> about know. my taco? I didn't adventures? know. I just asked what you had for lunch. I didn't know it was gonna be like you didn't know. You were you didn't know you were opening. You're Pandora's a taco box. purist. It's it's evolved that? over time. It's it evolved. Seems so. Well, you know the origin of that is we started oh out making de uh, we started out making um, stuffed stuffed bell peppers. Yeah, and you have to like basically do all that stuff in yeah. the pan, but then you like put it in the pepper, and then you bake it in the oven and all that, and then you just go and cut it up. And I'm like, why are we doing all this? Yeah, it was like an extra forty minutes of cooking. We've done that. I was like, why don't we just deconstruct that, We've cook the bell too. pepper, and just throw it in the pan, just make it all at once. It's way easier. Yep. And that's what got the whole thing rolling. Ah, and then so that it's, turned it's into technically more of like a deconstructed stuffed bell pepper on that we just do shells. in a pan, but then we just put on shells, and then ah. we started with the mango and the avocado and all the things, and it's and now it's, it's pretty awesome. Now it's taking over. Now it's a whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> so when we make it, I'm like, I'm I'm committed. I'm doing this for many many future meals. All right. And it keeps really well. And I just throw it in a bowl and microwave it and eat it during sustenance. meetings. Sustenance. Yep. <laughs> Literally, and that's how it goes. All right. 90, yeah. 97, you ready? Yeah, man. Here we go. <clears throat> Welcome, everybody, to episode number 97. Oh, my gosh. Almost at 100, Drew. I told you it was going to creep up the corner. on us. It's around the corner. Anyway. It's creeping. This is the Goulet Pencast, where fountain pens are still a thing. I'm Brian Goulet. I'm Drew Brown. And we are here from Goulet Pens to deliver this casual and informal, tangential and extraneous, superfluous and extemporaneous fountain pen show where we talk about what's going on at the Goulet Pen Company and in our fountain pen lives. In today's show, we're gonna be talking about revolutions in the fountain pen world, both past and future. Uh, we're gonna talk about our favorite fountain pens in movies, which Drew, you know movies. So I'm going to lean heavily on you for that question. Um, if we've ever thought about doing a Goulet, Goulet exclusive Kaweco or maybe other sub hundred dollar pens, uh, advice for attending a pen show for the first time, since we've got DC right around the corner. Uh, what's in my backpack? Somebody wants to know. And then Drew's got some questions for me about some of my OG handmade pens. So we're going to show you some of those as our pen spotlight. And then we got lots more nonsense about things we've been up to. That's right. So we'll kick this off with some feedback. 
like, our, a of, uh, like a lot of feedback. Man. Well, it looks like a lot. It's not really that much. Um, it's many people. Right, but we're not going to. Many people involved. We're not going to go all into that. <laughs> um, our friend Natalie wanted to, uh, at the precipice of our episode mm, 100, mention okay. that the average length of all of our oh 97 gosh. or 96 videos. <laughs> oh, it's a long. The average length is one hour, 54 minutes, six seconds. Wow. That's a lot. It is. That's a high it's average. It's creeped up over time. Yeah. The fact that the average is so high <laughs> means that we went over more than we yeah. went significantly we didn't under. Start, we didn't start out aiming no, to No, we started long. out with like an hour. I don't even know how we do it anymore, Drew. Like right now, as we're talking about it, this is how it goes. This along. is, yeah, this is two this. hours of this yeah, interjecting hours and creating. Anyway, moving on. And uh, she mentioned that the, uh, the length of the entire pencast playlist is oh, seven days so seven days <gasps> wow. 14 hours 34 minutes four seconds so it would take you if you've seen mm. every episode of the pencast you've spent over a full week with us a full week of your life yeah. you're, you're welcome also i'm you're better sorry for it. you're better for it yeah well, you know so. what i'm curious is if we added up all of the total like watch time for all of those pencasts oh my gosh like how much how much has humanity like been I don't want to feel that bad, Brian. Enlivened by this content. Anyway. Um, and then I we, we asked you last episode if you saw any sort of weirdness in the uh, Goulet logo ink splatter. Oh, yeah. And uh, we definitely got some uh, interesting interpretations. Okay. Uh, Joe thinks it looks like a headshot of Godzilla. Um, okay. SRFZON says the logo looks like someone hysterically laughing or screaming in terror at the top of their lungs. Which side is that? Is that like this side of the face? I don't know. Um... C line eight seven one seven says now that you mention it, doesn't it look like a lowercase G? I think that a couple of people said it looked kind of like a G. I don't, a little bit, I don't, a little bit. I can it, see it. It's rough. But uh, yeah. Joseph says that uh, looks like a head in profile. Jerry says it looks like Woodstock, Snoopy's little bird friend. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I don't see any of that. It's kind of like looking at a cloud. And yeah, you, like see a shape, and you're I, like, I wish okay. I could see it as a headshot of Godzilla, but. I, I just I just can't you can see it if you want to. Yeah, I'm looking at it now. Anyway, so then in, in Rubik's Cube mosaic form, it is a little rougher than like the actual logo. It's yeah, low res. So <laughs> there we go. That was entertaining. Mm -hmm. um, and then Melanie, with my favorite comment of the week, says, mm. "Drew, my husband proposed to me at Olive Garden too." Hey yo. Me and so Melanie. it's not that strange. Nope, not if Melanie's doing it. It's okay. Go. Melanie says, we were seated at a booth when he dropped his napkin and couldn't mm, reach it. Nice. We both bent down looking for it. And when I sat back up, my ring was in front of me in a lovely little box. We celebrated our 30th anniversary in April. So his little charade worked. Wow! Congrats. I've never heard of anyone else who got engaged at Olive Garden. Um, edited to add, we also thought the Olive Garden was kind of fancy back then, 92. It was. So its current reputation just makes the memory more novel and memorable to me. That's pretty great. So, yes. Thank you so much for that. I have to tell my wife because she's going to get a kick out of that. So, yes. Another c couple romantically uh, nuptialized, I don't know, at Olive Garden. I have a really good Olive Garden story to tell at some point. Not something that happened to me, but something that happened to a manufacturer. Okay. I'm debating if I should say it now or maybe bring it up later. But no, Write it down so you don't forget it. it. We can do it later. I kind of teed it up. Okay. You're teasing it. People are like, ooh, I have I to watch it. now. I, am I have to watch it. two hours of this just so I can hear this mystery. I haven't like explicitly gotten permission to share it because it's not my story, but it's not really like embarrassing or compromising. Well, you can change anything, the names so. of those involved. I could be I could be anonymous. One of the it. first dates Shannon and I went on, this was before we were dating, so it wasn't really a date, but we spent the day together and we uh, did go to Olive Garden um, in Virginia Beach. And she revealed to me later, years later, that she was extremely offended that I didn't offer her some of my ravioli. And I'm like, I'm not a food sharer. Shannon's always like, mm. so how's that? Let me try that. You want some of this? Let me try that. I'm like, mm. that's fine. But like, instinctively, that does not occur to me. It's not like for you. I mean, they... It is like family style. At when you're there, Garden, just because when you're there, your family doesn't mean, I mean it's the whole, family like, style. It, Italian family style thing is yeah. you're like digging in. And the later she's place. like, yeah, I remember you didn't give me any of your ravioli. Like, Why should I have given you some of my ravioli? See, that's not like a, that should be a given. It's not I, like, well, my plate is your plate. Let's I, all just right? share she, germs with each other. She was like, that boy's Offended okay. By them? He, he's okay. But you know what he didn't do? Give me some of his ravioli. I will say ravioli is pretty like... They're is, all little contained. So yes. you can just like share it's one. Like individually wrapped. It's not like it's like 
cake or something. Yeah. We're just like, let me get all up. You're yeah. all up in the bite you yeah. just took. She's a bit of a ravioli fiend. I'll tell you that. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Kind of ambivalent about ravioli. Her like it's she, fine. Carabas is one of like her favorite places to go because of the ravioli. Okay. And she's just crazy about it. It's pretty good. Yeah. Anyway, all right. We got more feedback. Okay. So <clears throat> this is um, from Cola Lo. As an indoor person, Brian's off work productivity is like time six of my own. <laughs> Listening to him talk is amazing. I did not know people could do so much. Well, I got some more to share. You know what I said today. to this? I said to this person in the comments, <laughs> I said, yes, it's exhausting sometimes just hearing it. I sometimes yeah. feel like just tired. I'm not, a, not like I'm you're putting tire, me to sleep. I'm gonna tire you out today. Oh, God. I'm gonna tell you about what I did over the weekend. Oh, jeez, Brian. Get ready. Oh my God. Get ready. Anyway, well, cool, I'm glad. <laughs> it's literally something like I've, I'm in therapy talking about this. Like, why? <laughs> Why do I work so hard? Why can't hard? I stop? Why doing do I have things? why do I have no chill? <laughs> <laughs> it's a thing. It's a thing. Anyway, <laughs> it's a common thing throughout my entire life, oh not just God. a work thing or whatever. Anyway, it's my DNA. Meanwhile, I'm like, why don't I have any motivation at all? No. Yeah, no. Yeah. The grass is always greener, right? Um, okay, from Just Beth Trying. If Drew is the embodiment of an exclamation mark, Brian is an Open and three paragraphs later, close parentheses. I found that entertaining. I don't know what it means really, but. Oh, it means like, at least me in terms of. You, have a, you have a lot of tangential thoughts? Yeah. Okay. I'll like add a lot of unnecessary. There you go. Perhaps, okay. A lot of optional context <laughs> <laughs> in a very lengthy fashion. Very I, nice. I'm, I'm tracking. I don't think it is an insult. It is very valid, especially in this setting <laughs> or in ellipses. Maybe I'm just in ellipses yeah. because. It, it, I'll just go on. Yeah. Anyway. I think of Casino Royale every every time I think of Ellipses. Oh, that's such a good movie. Yeah. Because that was the first time I actually ever actually knew that the, the dots had a name. Yeah. Was in Casino Royale. Oh. Yeah. That was where I learned cool. that. Well, there you go. Learning things. How about that? All right. Vivid Valora says, I actually tried fountain pens because I was getting into calligraphy. Last week you mentioned like, I don't think anybody who actually... Like gets into calligraphy first pen. and then yeah. gets into fountain pen. This was not the only person. There was probably I didn't say about, not anybody, but not most people. Oh, okay. I, yeah, there I was don't know exactly what I said, but a bunch of people chimed in. Was like me, 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 me. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. I'm so glad you're here. Um, anyway, she says, "So glad I did, and so glad I found you guys too." Me and my sister-in-law are super excited for the new Ninja Turtles movie. We we're just talking about that earlier. Uh, it will probably be the first movie we watch in the theater in a while. Pacific Rim is one of the movies that I can actually watch over and over. And it is one of the few movies that I've picked out that my family also liked. So Drew. That's solid. That's a solid a movie flick. reviewer. Solid flick. It arrived. You and I could review movies together. You would have all the information and I would just comment and ask questions and be like, why, why is that happening? Who is that again? You know what we should watch together? <laughs> that we were flying on a plane together one time and I don't know if it was like I don't know which director. It was a well-known director, but there was a movie called Alita: Battle Angel, and someone near you was watching it, and you just could not stop commenting about how it made no sense. Oh yeah, she was like some cyborg girl, and oh, the yeah. whole time you're just like, "What is that? Why are they there? What is I don't what things come? Why is some, that coming out of her elbow? Like, why does she need that? What? Yeah, I remember. And you're I was just cracking up. Like, yeah, that right there would have been the perfect like Drew Bryan commentary movie. Yeah, because I'd be like. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And you'd just be super practical the whole time. Like, that doesn't make any sense. That wouldn't happen. The, it's, a, it's a blessing and a curse. That, like joint, I, that joint wouldn't move like that. <laughs> it's true. I am really kind of a pain when I do that. Like, when I watch, like, oh, my gosh, like, Grey's Anatomy or something like that with Rachel. If I'm watching something that I really want to watch, I'll suspend reality a little bit. You know, but if I'm watching something, I'm like. But if it's just there. Eh, I don't really care so much. <laughs> You'll like it. ruin it. I ruin it for other people. <laughs> Because I'm just like critiquing it and oh, pulling it apart. Man. You know, Rachel's watching Grey's Anatomy or whatever. I'm like, that would never happen. Oh my God. Who would do that? How many persons, how many people has that person slept with? Like, isn't yeah. that an HR issue at this point? <laughs> right. Like, you know what I mean? I'll, I'll just pick it apart like that. And she's like, Brian, you need to go away. I'm like, yeah, yeah you're right. I know what I'm doing. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe one day when we, you know, start a Patreon for this uh, pencast, it'll Ooh. be, you'll, you'll get to download an episode of just Brian and I having like, you know, movie watch homework and we can come and discuss mm. all of our takeaways yeah i could review severance that's about it <laughs> you certainly could that i could i could go on and on about anyway uh amy owens says loved the history of the ink spot logo which we just talked about but i need to know who wrote the script for the logo 
So uh, we've had a couple iterations over the years, but the one that we've been using since we redesigned our website in 2018 was done by master penman Jake Weidman, who is a personal friend and just a really solid dude and an unbelievably talented calligrapher, master Indeed. penman. So go check out his site, jakeweidman.com. His work is absolutely mind blowing. I was actually surprised and, that uh, Amy didn't know this because I've actually spoken to Amy hmm. um, a few times and she is a calligrapher herself and oh, is yeah. a member of that thing that Jake Weidman is a part of. Yes. Yeah. The International mm, Ampath. I am path. Yes, that thing. International Association of Master Penmen and something E-U-T-H, whatever that is. Turtle yes. houses. But it's like the, the the formal place for calligraphers and master people. Um, yeah. Well, there you go. Jake's work is amazing. Go check him out. And he's just such a good person. Yeah. Like legitimately. I did an interview with him years ago. He was at the DC show. Um, one of the couple of people I've met in my life who I legitimately like fanboyed out when I met him in real life. And he kind of did the same. It was adorable. Anyway, <laughs> uh, let's talk about some new stuff, shall we? <clears throat> All right, Drew, I got a couple of bin news to talk about, but I'm not going to talk about them long because they're not going to be here long. First one, one is of them might. one of them might. And the one that might is the Talisman fountain pen. This is a very interesting shaped model that we have that they've done. Uh, basically, they have it themed around, you know, they did like a four leaf clover. Lucky theme charms. One, dream bean. Good fortune items. Yeah, there's yeah. always like a folklore-ish kind of, you know, I'm not going to say supernatural, but you know. Talisman. So the talisman, the yeah. Talisman. Yeah, exactly. Something related to that. And this one is lavender. Uh, it looks beautiful, I will say. Like, I'm not like a diehard purple pen fan, but when done right, I'm like, oh, that is striking. And, and this, this one is done This one right. is very striking. Yeah. So it's really, really cool looking. Go check it out. $160. It is a limited edition. Um, but number six, stainless steel nib. They use Yovo nibs. They write great. Um, so yeah, if you like that pen. And I like them because they're like, they're big, but they're not super heavy too. That's kind of like most news at this point. Um, so yeah, standard international cartridge, good nib size options, um, $160. So not the cheapest pen in the world, but I think it's worth it if you really like this color. And it's like one of those that like it photographs well, but when you see it in person, there's like, I don't know, it's pretty much all news, but there's so much going on. It just, in person, it just shows so much better. It's the way the light moves across all yeah. of the shiny bits. Yeah. That, it, it, exactly. It does have some movement to it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, then the other one, which I'm going to touch on very quickly and then move on, another Banu, super limited pen. There's like 100 pens globally. We're getting a handful. It'll probably be gone by the time this video publishes, honestly. Um, the Swallows Song, it is a hand-painted pen of a swallow and it looks pretty cool and it's blue and it's gone so 280 dollars <laughs> is what it was and you'll never see it again drew <laughs> all right um let's see visconti has come out with a new van gogh and it is called flowering plum orchard and right. um it is a uh, i believe japanese themed um because i didn't know this but apparently van gogh had a you know affinity for japanese art at, Makes uh, sense. He did a lot of flowers yeah. and was like into that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. So it's a lovely uh, reddish burgundy pen with mm. some uh, nice depth to it, as all Van Gogh resins happen to have. And it is two hundred and seventy-six dollars. So this will be um, mm -hmm. uh, out by time this video publishes, and um, also out by time this video publishes will be mm -hmm. a popper from Retro Fifty One called Dino Smash. And they're doing something where you don't really know which pen you're going to get. So this is going to be right. a rollerball, not a fountain pen. Um, mm -hmm. I don't have a ton of information on it as of right now. I don't have any pictures either because it is secret. So new. But right now, when you're seeing this, it's not secret. So <laughs> yes. you can see it, but I can't. Yeah. Um, but anyway, that's available. I think we'll probably still have a few left over. But uh, I don't I know. No, it's kind of a no mystery idea. how desirable a you know, bit of a mystery pen will be, but um, I mean, it's not like they're wildly different. They're, they're you know, different shades, different colors. Yeah. You know, it's pretty wild looking colorways. Color. It's a fun, it's a fun pen. Yeah. 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 Cool. Well, there you go. All right. After last week, it's refreshing to have yeah. a little shorter list. But Not quite as many. Anyway, you can definitely check out any of our like new arrivals coming soon, all that kind of stuff. We've got that in a little tab on the top of our website, Goodly Pens. Uh, and let's get in some Q&A, shall we, Drew? Let's say some Q. We got some. All right. Drew, we got a paragraph here. We do. We have a paragraph, paragraph. from James Yu. Okay. And James is asking us or mm. saying... 
fountain pens have remained pretty consistent in their design since mm -hmm. their widespread use started mm -hmm. around the late 19th century. Okay. Improvements in fountain pen designs since have seemed evolutionary rather than revolutionary. Mm -hmm. But since 21st century has seen huge leaps in science and technology, here's the critical part. Do you think a big new leap or revolution is possible for fountain pens? Mm. And in your decade plus of experience as a fountain pen enthusiast slash retailer, was there any new feature or innovation that you thought was a game changer or alternatively a new feature that just did not impress you? So James mm. is asking, do you a think we'll bundle of questions? Do you think we'll see a big evolution mm. in fountain pen technology? And also, has there been mm. since you've been into it, or has there been any flops? I mean, you're talking about like a 150 year history. So the short answer is pretty yeah, well. No, I think sure, he's, he's probably, saying, you know, um, in your decade. Were there, oh, right, right, were there right. any like innovations? One, yeah, that, that last part yeah. of it, yeah. So it was interesting because as I read this, I was like, you know, fountain pens really for their time, they really were revolutionary. Like before fountain pens came along, you had like dip pens, like you had quills, feather quills, which you had to go harvest from a bird, like an animal. And then you'd have to like cut the tip and prepare it. They would wear out really quick. So it like was like it was like a natural resource, yeah, yeah, a pterodactyl. They, that's right. We they they suspect they may have been feathered, huh? We don't know. Those made the best pens. I see. We weren't taught that in school. Back when, when Pluto was a planet too, it's like, what oh, are you going to do? You. Anyway, um, what was I talking about? Not dinosaurs, that's for sure. Um, Sorry. So you had quills, and then like mid eighteen hundreds, probably there was like a period where there was an evolution from the feather quills to like metal, like writing tip. So like there was a concept sort of like a nib, you know, that started to happen. So you'd have like a feather with a sort of a nib on it. So at least would, you know, there was like mass production of spring steel, like that type of stuff. But even still it was a dip pen. So it was like not super portable, but the fountain pen when it came out, the idea of being able to travel with a single writing instrument that had the ink and everything loaded in it, it was revolutionary for the time. It was like the the mobile phone of its time. Um, before that, you had to basically have like a like a a writing desk, like a traveling writing desk that you would haul around like luggage, and that was your that was your like briefcase laptop sort of of that time. When then you had the fountain pen, it was like I can write, I can sign. It was. It was amazing. Um, but it was interesting because around that same time, still too, you had the typewriter that came out, which also was a very fast communicating tool, obviously different than a pen, but still in terms of like, you know, authors and you think of like Hemingway and people like that, you know, there was like a lot of that going on at the same time. So that also, you know, it's hard to say like, which was more revolutionary, you know? And in fact, the two kind of influenced each other because when you think about especially like in America, I know like the Palmer method of cursive, which is kind of what we grew up using. That was actually developed to be more competitive with the speed of a typewriter. Oh. I don't know if you knew that. No. But that was like like Palmer, the whatever the guy's name, Arnold. I'm just kidding. That's him. <laughs> Different fam Palmer. Famous for his lemonade and iced tea. <laughs> Different Palmer, yeah. Um, that was part of the Palmer method because before that you had Spencerian, which was like this very ornate, very like, you know, your, your handwriting is driven into your values as a person, kind of a thing that was popular in like the late 1800s, early 1900s. But Palmer was like, we gotta get crap done here. So like, let's, let's minimize the ornate nature of letters. Let's make them consistent and fast and all that kind of stuff because the typewriter's comment is gonna take over everything, which is kind of funny because you think about like computers and AI and all that, blah, blah, blah. It was like the exact same argument happening of like, oh, the, the personal values instilled in our handwriting are being like undermined by these machines that are communicating with typewriters and all that. So it's kind of funny how, the cycli typewriter how was cyclical AI. that is yeah. for sure. Actually, total tangent, but- I thought we were already on a tangent. We're on a tangent of a tangent, <laughs> but here we go. Tangent inception. In the early 1900s, if you take the same conversation about like social media, AI, all this type of stuff, there was that exact same conversation going on about the kaleidoscope. The kaleidoscope? The kaleidoscope. It was like Like the thing like, filled with beads yes. that makes shapes. Yes. Children were not like 
um in reality anymore they were like Lost escaping the, oh. to this alternate world kind of a thing and there wow. was like all this hoopla about the kaleidoscope and how it was like harming society and children's wow. minds it's pretty pretty ironic yeah anyway let's i did not know that let's dunk ourselves in the water and come out of that level of inception <laughs> and you remember we will, remarkably uh, much I of that I movie. watched it relatively recently. Oh, really? So yeah, nice. I saw it was in your notes, and I was oh, like, nice. oh, well, let's talk Inception. Anyway, so coming back out a level. Um, okay, so we're, I, I'm, I got lost in my own thoughts. Typewriters, okay, I mentioned that. Okay, so really fountain pens were the revolution. So when James asked this question, I was like, I think if you're talking about an actual revolution, you're not talking about being in fountain pens anymore. Like the revolution was fountain pens. To have another revolution, you're out of fountain pens. Mm -hmm. And that happened. It was yeah. the ballpoint. Yeah. The ballpoint pen, when it came around, really, it was developed in like the 30s, 40s. But once it became reliable and like affordable to be mass produced in the 50s and 60s, it usurped the fountain pen pretty quickly as the mainstay writing instrument. Now, fountain pens are still around because people love them and they're the best. But in terms of the communicative tool, the, the revolutionary writing instrument that they were, they were revolutionized into the ballpoint, unfortunately. So I think that's my answer is that it already was revolutionized. Um, now you can contextualize it to stay within the fountain pen, which is probably where James is actually getting at with this question. But I just thought it was like important to note that it was revolutionized because if you look back vintage wise and you think about like how many Parker 51s and how many like vintage Schaefer's and stuff are out there, Esther Brooks, the originals, they made millions and millions and millions of these pens because they were commodities of the time. Nowadays, it's like there's no one pen that sells any, like a fraction of what they sold back at those times just because it's not the commodity that it used to be. So what you're saying is that fountain pens are Pikachu and ballpoints hmm. are Raichu. Yeah. Raichu's technically <laughs> better, but no one cares about him. But Pikachu is He's still, lame. Pikachu's way people cooler. People love Pikachu. There you go. People love Pikachu. Pikachu's found. Exactly. Pens. That's a good, good, that's, a, that's an But if you want to, you can evolve into something more lame if you want to. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> it's technically more powerful, but, you know, not as, not as adorable. Um, so, yes, uh, that was the real revolution. And then, honestly, if you want to keep going down that road, you could argue that, like, ballpoints and rollerballs have been revolutionized with computers and mobile technology and voice yeah. and AI and all that kind of stuff. So the the, the revolution continues, right? Um, if you think about it as like a writing communicating tool, yeah. it's it's many generations past being revolutionized. Uh, and fountain pens are just like this little time capsule uh, that we can still enjoy today. Um, so I would say that anything that stays within the realm of fountain pens isn't gonna be a revolution, but an evolution. Mm -hmm. So really that's all we're talking about is like an evolution within the fountain pen revolution. Yeah, that, that right? is what they were asking. Yeah, you know? that's 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 my very honest take on it all. Um, but I think like there have been, been many innovations within fountain pens. So thinking more like evolu evolutionary, right? Um, after the initial burst, there was like an initial burst of patents and, and design, especially because you think about what was happening in the early 1900s, the industrial revolution. You had this boom of like science and technology and chemistry. There was so much going on. Penicillin was coming out. You had Einstein and like the, the astrophysics and all this kind of stuff that was being discovered. Germ like theory and all that kind of stuff was coming about in science, which changed medicine altogether. Um, it was around that same time that materials science was being developed and that what played a big part in evolving fountain pens into what they became. So you had things like, you know, hard rubber, right? Which, you know, that vulcanization type process, which, you know, allowed pens to be a lot more durable and mass produced. And then you had, you know, celluloid, nitrocellu nitrocelluloid, and then, you know, other plastics and the evolution of plastics and acrylics and what they were able to do for mass produced writing instruments. Those, all of that was kind of converging and happening. And then you get into metal science and, and metallurgy and things like that and being able to use that in different ways. Um, even things like modern stainless steel, um, you know, has evolved as well. So uh, all of that kind of stuff converged around those early 1900s and we saw a boom. If you look at a lot of the patents and stuff that came around with fountain pens, feed designs, you know, filling mechanisms that became staples for decades. A lot of that was happening in those early 1900s. And then obviously as the commoditization kind of died out in like the 50s and 60s, fountain pens became more niche and there was just less evolving and innovation that was happening because 
there was just less money behind it all. You yeah. Know, it moved on. So it became less, you know, a little more iterative and a little more, you know, design oriented. And, you know, because they became like more collectible, more status oriented. People were choosing to use fountain pens as an alternative to more commoditized writing instruments. So it makes sense that they, that, that would slow down quite a bit. Um, I will say also that like ink has changed quite a bit as well. You oh, know, yeah. If you talk about. Yeah. So ink around those times was honestly a lot of it was like. It's not fun. Cancerous. <laughs> not, oh, also not, that. Not good materials. You had things like camphor and stuff like that that was in it. So it was like mm, not the best. Uh, that's when everybody was like putting asbestos into their houses and using lead paint and these things that are like not the best anymore. You know, but um, uh, ink is is one thing. I, and I would say like since we, since I started in 2009 and you shortly after. Ink for sure has been a huge thing. I, it's technically not pens, but it's certainly related. The number of inks that have come out and the innovations that have come out in ink to me stand out as something that is much more much more recent. Yeah, and um, they're definitely the inks that have come out in the last ten years are inks that were made for fun. Yes, you can look at the yeah. assortment of ink. Just if you saw a big color chart of all the inks now versus all the inks twelve years ago one is going to look like this was made for people to play with yeah because you've got sparkles now you've got all these crazy light colors that really aren't super practical for mm -hmm. an office setting but no. it's not for that anymore they're it's higher for maintenance fun. they're kind of a pain yeah exactly it's but, but that that shows you where the fountain pen yeah. market is now it's yeah. fun it's mm -hmm. for entertaining yourself and mm -hmm. you know for passion and enjoyment absolutely so um yeah the ink thing was definitely one this is another one that like, I don't know if technically this would fit into the nature of the question, but the biggest change I've seen kind of like in the fountain pen community, fountain pen industry as a whole has been the rise of social media and the internet. Oh yeah. And we, we rode that wave. That was why we got into this business is because we saw that was happening and what an opportunity to spread what is naturally a really cool thing with fountain pens. But to be able to share that with others and educate and be able to sit down and film and talk like this for two an hour and 59 minutes and six seconds every week <laughs> or 54 minutes. Yeah. So it's like being able to do that has been such that has, that has been a much more, I don't know if it's been revolutionary, but it's, it's been a, a heavy evolution within the fountain pen community, not necessarily around like the, the specific products themselves, though there's things I could definitely kind of point out in that realm. But to me, that has been the thing that has changed the most in fountain pens has been the rise of social media and the, the online community and what that's done for fountain pens. Um, so that, that to me stands out quite a bit. Um, and then uh, I would say like the, the innovation of like small batch manufacturing, specifically like with resins, like mm -hmm. seeing people making their own resins and just independent pen makers. Um, we have sort of our origin story and that's actually kind of fitting because we're gonna be showing some of my wood pens from back in the day. Um, but that's that's honestly how I even saw fountain pens i never i probably never would have discovered fountain pens had i not been a pen maker seeking you know ways to find more people that were into pens because i just it wasn't in my my world um and so like myself that's where i came from was being a small pen maker who had the opportunity to sell my wares and there's a number of you know pen companies who I mean, literally every pen company started out with somebody with the idea, but you know, smaller folks like Edison pens, they started out just one dude making pens and now he's got a whole team with CNC equipment and Franklin Kristoff is another one that's kind of in the same boat. And you know, you got like Jonathan Brooks. Yeah, I think you have these. to mention Jonathan Brooks as one of the original. He's been like, a huge one with the materials. Right, I think he, yeah. he was the first one I saw that was really yeah. shocking people with his homemade mm -hmm. resins. And now yeah. you see his resins on some of the most mm -hmm. prolific pen companies in the world. For sure. So For sure. yeah, he was at the forefront of that. And yeah. now a lot of people have, you know, you know, drawn inspiration from that. And we've got yeah. a ton of really awesome materials out yeah. there. Yeah. But if you go to a pen show now, which we'll also talk about a little bit later, the number of like independent pen makers, Ian Schoen, another good example. Like these are people who, because of how, you know, um, democratize. Uh, you have like the marketing efforts, the being able to serve customers directly all over geographically, um, you know, the the information that you can get about different equipment and materials and that kind of stuff. That bar has been lowered so much 
you got Gravitas, you've got, gosh, there's all kinds of ones that keep coming to mind of like basically like one person shops yeah. or they started out maybe as one person shops um, that are able to be basically a pen brand. Um, that's been pretty cool. So not specific to like any one type of pen, but I think that that, that you know, probably weaves into like the whole social media education sharing yeah. kind the, of a the, thing. It revolutionized or evol evolutionarily advances the industry yeah. and the hobby and the community. Yeah, exactly. But I, you know, I'm talking all these like generalizations, sort of big, bigger things, but I, I wanted, I was like, okay, Brian, I need to come with like at least one specific thing. There you go. And so I thought of stainless steel flex nibs. Mm -hmm. That was something that I had never seen before, when I first got into this business. And to give full credit, Noodlers is the one that really pushed the envelope there. There's a bunch of other options now. They did. But really up until that point, flex nibs in general was either viewed as like, oh, that's a vintage thing. Mm -hmm. That's honestly, it was very hard to understand and get into because it was not standardized. Or it was something like, oh, nib meisters can modify things or you have soft nibs like the Pilot Falcon. And if you want it to really be made flexible, you can get it modified. Yeah. But even but then, then you're no, in a gold territory. You're in a gold point. territory, you're into hundreds of dollars. Yeah. But for somebody new into fountain pens, like I was newer at the time, I can't remember when Noodlers first came out with their flex nib, but I want to say it was late 2010, early 2011. It was a while ago. And, you know, it was it was something that was remarkably affordable at the time. I think it was the, nib, like 14 bucks? the nib Creeper. Original Nib Creeper was 14 bucks. Mm -hmm. And it was like it, people were in disbelief and like it, performed frankly quite well yeah, it was like nothing else extremely hot at the time so at I, the time i'm not gonna say it was like the first one that ever happened it was certainly the first i was ever aware of it and you know love him or hate him nathan has certainly opened up in the fountain pen community opened up people's um you know desire and and um willingness to try flex nibs in a way that i had not seen before that's he true. started doing that so that's been like the single biggest physical kind of product innovation that i've seen and now you've since got we started. you know the largest nib manufacturer in the world or the largest independent nib manufacturer in the world mm -hmm. yovo, yovo making, yeah. making uh yeah, gold making, and steel flex nibs yep yeah, yeah i don't think that would have happened had there not been kind of like the groundswell of like gra grassroots interest there was a definitely a massive interest in affordable flex nibs you know I, I think that interest was always sort of there yeah no. but i mean you and i have noticed this too over the years years ago people didn't really understand flex they thought like you would just get a flex pen and all of a sudden be a master calligrapher and not understanding the limitations and all the physics behind it and all that kind of stuff it we've spent a uh, many 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 hours <laughs> trying to educate people and, and get that straight and our customer service team has spent a lot of time yeah so many returns so yeah exactly so but, many ruined nibs yeah and then that just that still happens for sure but i feel like i feel like there's a lot better understanding oh, about what they are now absolutely. versus a decade ago yeah but you know it's a it's been a bit it's been a big thing people it's, have a much more clear expectation of what steel nibs are truly capable of now yeah, yeah. than they used to because like you said it used to be that the frame of reference was for a wet noodle vintage nib yeah and it took years for people to understand that you're not going to get that with the steel nib well, and I think so, some of the reason that that happened, and this is not to like critique noodlers or anything, but some of it, it was, it was so much more affordable when they came out with that pen versus really the only other commercially made alternative you had at that time was the the Falcon, which was the Namiki Falcon at the time. Now it's the Pilot Falcon, which at the time was like $140, $160. And then the noodlers pen comes out at 14 you're going to get a lot of people who are just very casual or like, yeah, I'll try it. What the heck? It was definitely a $14 pen. Like, yeah, it for was. sure. It was. But people expected know. it more out of it. Yeah. If that pen, if a pen like that had come out and it was $60, you wouldn't have gotten people who would be quite as casual trying to use it. You know what I mean? Maybe. Like, it's like, it's like if you make something too affordable, it brings all kinds of people into it who maybe haven't done as much research or time or oh, are willing see, to invest as much in learning how to use it. So, so I think you're talking about like maybe like a barrier for entry, you mean? The barrier was so low yeah. that it brought a lot of people in who didn't even really kind of take, maybe necessarily take the time to understand I how see. to use them and that kind of a thing. So so it took a few years to kind of overcome that a little bit. And I feel like it's, it's stabilizing a little better. But anyway, um, as far as new features that didn't impress me, um, the one that I thought of, and I don't know if this is new, it was probably around before our time, but I feel like it's been it's been tried several times since we started. It's the refillable roller ball. 
the worst and, of both worlds, and, yes, as I've, you say. As I've said around our <laughs> office, we've tried. We've tried several of them. Noodler's had one. Monteverde has a couple. Yeah. And like they're they're there's nothing against any of these pens. I Cuecos had them. We still got to try that um, pilot one that uh, we had feedback on. There, there's a pilot refillable pilot rollerball, and I, I keep forgetting the name okay. of it, but I, I, I need to buy one of those. I keep forgetting. Okay. So maybe, yeah, sure. I I don't know. I'm yeah. skeptical because none of them that I've ever used I'm have impressed sure, me. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it takes a pilot cartridge, but um, okay, yeah, maybe. I mean, pilot their precise pen is basically a fountain pen with a roller ball. I it. think that's what it is. Wait, the precise? No. That's not a refillable pen. Oh, okay. Now there, there's, there's one probably out some there. precise variant. Yeah, yeah. Like maybe it's like the precise, like I don't know. It's like a tip V2 or something. I don't know. Okay. Well, I haven't tried that, but. I could be convinced, but my my problem is with your refillable roller balls. It's good in theory. It's basically like, oh, it's the convenience of a roller ball. It doesn't like dry out and things like that. But you can still use your fountain pen ink with it and refill it and clean it and that kind of stuff. And it's oh, like V five. That's cool. And st- the V five. Okay, I feel like I've heard about that. Yeah. Look. V5? So it takes a standard. It takes a cartridge. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's like a precise, but with a cartridge. Okay. High tech point. Yeah. V5 high tech point. Okay. So uh, I've heard of that. So we got to get our hands on one of these. Give it a shot. Is it available in the US? I feel like we would have I mean, known about it or been asked about I'm it. On, I'm on the A word website. So, oh, well, you know, you can get kind okay. of anything there. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. The ones that we've tried to sell, they've never been good. Nah. It's been all the maintenance of yes. a fountain pen with the writing experience of a rollerball. Yeah. I suppose though, if you are gonna, you know, endeavor down that path, uh, spending five bucks is not the worst. You For know. the pilot one? Yeah. Yeah, I'm curious. And yeah. if you, hey, if y'all have tried other ones and you think I'm totally wrong, let me know because I don't think I am, but maybe you like <laughs> having a inferior writing <laughs> high maintenance pen. I don't know. People use all kinds of crazy Yeah, if you're going to go through the day. maintenance, why not have the writing pleasure as well, right? That, that's that's kind of it for me. There wasn't enough benefit to outweigh the hassle. Yeah. It's like, just use a fountain pen. It's actually easier to maintain and yeah. it writes so much better. There you go. Anyway, what about you, Drew? Do you have anything? Um, no, the only the only modern thing that I was like, sometimes they don't get right. Uh, I will say that I don't think that uh, as of yet, anybody has been able to truly nail the retractable um, mechanic. Uh, Pilot and the vanishing point does it and does it well. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you've got pens like the Dialogue. Like, that's fine, but... It's cool. The engineering is cool, but it's... It's not super practical. It's complicated. It's not... It doesn't seal as well as the vanishing point. You've got the Da Vinci that's just kind of weird. And then you've got the... You've got the new endless the, pen. You've got the Curados. The Curados, and they're like they're the, you they know, work, but they're not they, like they work. They, they're it, they're not a vanishing point. They're not a vanishing point. So that that point. that technology, like I would say that all of the people that have tried to be the vanishing point, in meaning a retractable fountain pen, I, I'm not going to say that they have stumbled or fallen flat because I don't think that that does it justice. But I, I don't think they've hit the bullseye either. So I would say mm. that that technology is have been pretty consistently underwhelming for me, mm. other than the vanishing point. So uh, I think someone will be able to do it eventually, but right now that you know the title still belongs to Pilot. Mm-hmm. And then um, as far as something I think could revolutionize, uh, I would think that eventually, once metal 3D printing becomes a thing, mm-hmm. and we can 3D print a nib under exact specifications without having to weld an alloy tip. Uh, I mean, I don't think it's gonna happen. Never. Well, the tip is a different metal. It is. So I don't know how you... You can would... do different filaments in one uh, in one um, printing, right? I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's, do you it's... know how hot you would have to get I don't rhodium know. to be I... able to make a tip out of it? I don't like... know. I'm saying like <laughs> it's not it's not going to happen anytime soon. But I'm saying like if, if w- nibs seem to be the thing that if you're really going to revolutionize mm. the fountain pen experience, if you can more consistently produce a nib um that mm. would be the way to change the game a bit yeah is to is to be able to somehow replicate flawlessly mm. a fountain pen nib that is Tough. that without you know the old school 
you know, welding machinery that's currently being I used. It's funny. I've seen, we've, we've toured factories. Yeah, and even Lamy, who has seen... the, the most high-tech facility, probably, you know, right next to Pilot in the industry. Yeah. Um, even they can't have 100% consistency with their steel nibs. They're pretty good. I they're mean, pretty yeah, good, but it's not like you, you grab 10 extra fines like and you're going to get, you know, seven that look the same and then, you know, a couple that, uh, you know, not so I don't much. Think it's, I don't think it's that they couldn't do it. It's that they can't do it economically. Mm. You know, like the yeah, machinery so. is there. The precision is there. Oh, so sure. I mean, they, they, you, you can like if, if, if NASA but, was making them, they could do it. Sure. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, it's, so it's like it's and again, that that this whole debate gets to like, well, if you do anything at scale, you can make it like revolutionary, affordable yeah. and stuff like that. But it's like fountain pens really they just aren't there anymore. No, but like, like if, if the 3D printing, it's tough. 3D printing could at some point become so accessible and so affordable perhaps, perhaps. that theoretically, if you know a you know independent maker has access to the ability to 3D print metal something. That is interesting. I didn't think about 3D printing. So 3D printing metal, that's a little more like science fiction territory to me at this point. But like 3D printing resin pens is yeah very possible. Oh, for sure, but. But the only ones that I've ever seen, I haven't even seen anything recently, but I've seen like Kickstarters from five years ago. Mm -hmm. They looked like a hot pile of garbage. I've like, seen some good ones. They look rough. I have, I have, like, I have a 3D they, printed one that, you they know. look 3D printed. Mine does look know? 3D printed, but it's it's really, it's it seals really well. Okay. The, the weave is tight. You still feel, you know, if you're on your fingernail, you feel right. the layers, but yeah. um, it's done really well. I think that, I'm if curious, the, like, is if that... the technology continues to advance at a good pace, we could see that change the game a bit. I am kind of curious because like 3D printers have been around for a minute now. Mm -hmm. And like I know for like rapid prototyping and things like that. And I that, think you can 3D print metal. Probably. I think that I think that's a thing. Certain metals. Yeah. Certain metals. But I mean you're talking about like tipping material. That's some of the hardest metal that's yeah. around. That's no, precious you're, metals. You're, you're right. You're, you're right. I mean, I don't know what the melting point is of rhodium, but it's Friggin' hot! There. I'm yeah. willing to bet, but I don't know. I could be wrong. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe. I mean, when you're welding, when you're laser welding, like that's hot. I don't know. Welding, you're it's as hot as the surface of the sun. Jeez, do you know that? No. Like a plasma cutter? No. I have a plasma torch. It's as hot as it's like fifty thousand degrees or something. That's kind of frightening. That humans could create something like that. It's terrifying. Yikes. Yeah. Anyway, anyway. Well, we just spent quite a long we time did. on question number one. Yeah, I wonder how we go so long every time. Okay. <laughs> All right, got a shorter one. All right. Drew, this is from Jackany. Jackany? Jasony. -E. I don't know how you pronounce your name, but that's how I pronounce it. Do you ever look for fountain pens in movies? If yes, which are your favorite? I don't know if favorite pens are favorite movies. Um, I mean, yeah. I mean, when, when, when you see, you know, when I'm watching. Period, how do you not look for yeah, it? Yeah, exactly. You know? How do you not? Like with in period pieces and you're on a desk, you're like, okay, there's a fountain pen somewhere there. Right. And I don't know why I do it because I don't know anything about vintage pens. So if right. I did find one and I often do, I'm like, oh, look, a fountain pen. I have no idea what that is. Right. So it's exciting. If it's even like a real pen. It's exciting. Yeah, sometimes they're not. It might not. be like a prop pen. Right. Like, you so, know, yeah. so that leads me to my other thing. The, the, Fountain pen I've wanted to identify the most in any movie is mm. the fountain pen that Marty McFly uses when he writes the letter to Doc Brown at the end of Back to the Future 1. Huh. He writes him a letter telling him that he needs to beware that he's going to get shot the night he goes back in time in 1985. And it's a really... He says, don't open this until 1985. It's a really yeah. amazing moment. I and, know you wrote that with and the it's a pen. And there's, there's so many good shots of the pen, but I have no idea what it is. And I've looked on FPN. I don't think that anybody knows. It, I, so it might be a prop pen. It could be. There's a couple theories uh, as to what it is. But every time I watch oh, I'm doing a Google search. I'm just getting the Paniter Back to the Future pen. Yeah, like, of oh, course. Thanks, okay. Paniter. <laughs> Making so, my Google search harder. Yeah. And then every now and then um, you'll see like a modern um, thing that you think is a fountain pen. Like I know that I was watching Moon Knight when that was new in a thing. And I saw a white Lamy Safari. I'm pretty sure it was a rollerball. So you'll see some modern fountain pens or like what you think is a fountain, but then it turns out they're actually rollerballs and you get sad and disappointed. So unfortunately, most of the pens out there in movies are from period pieces and are pens that I just am not super familiar with. So it's a mix of uh, both excitement and um, 
you know, a humbling opportunity when I realize I don't know. I got a picture, as of, Mar- got a picture of Marty writing his letter. Here. Yeah, I it's I don't know what it is. There's a couple of people say like, oh, I think it's a Schaefer or something, but this back end is wrong, so it can't be that. And some other person. It you looks know. like a Schaefer script bottle of ink. So Schaefer. Yeah, the the bottle of ink is definitely Schaefer. But I mean, it's a movie. Who knows? Yeah, what that doesn't means. like doesn't you know matching ink to pens back then was not a not a necessity. It probably wasn't there. Most important, like, point of authenticity no. in the production of the movie. No. So, yeah, that that's definitely my favorite use of a fountain pen in a movie. It's sense. one of my favorite movies of all time. Top three, yeah. for sure. Mm. Um, but uh, I don't know what it is. So, there it's a go. bummer. If I if I did know what it was, I would probably would go out of my way. Absolutely. You would probably get yeah. it. I would, I would go out of my way to buy You'd that have to one. get it, yeah. yeah. That would be my first vintage fountain pen purchase. I've been, really? I've, I've been given a few, but I've never bought one. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we'll see. Well, that would be a good one. If you had oh, one, sh- absolutely. that would be the one. Yeah, absolutely. What about you? Um, I, I'm i like you. If I see it in some sort of pop culture, I'll be like, hey, it's a fountain like, pen. Ooh. I personally, I'm like, I'll spend three minutes researching what it is, but then I'm like, ah, oh, whatever. I don't care. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I think it's interesting, but I'm not like obsessed with pen spotting, if you will. Um, frankly, because... So like, what am I going to do like with that information? Said, well, it's like, it's oftentimes it's props or it's not really shown yeah. much or it's, you know, some period piece, but like they know that most people don't know pens that well. The fact that you have any fountain pen is like, oh, friggin' nailed it, prop master. You know, the the specific brand and all this kind of stuff. Um, but one the one thing, kind of like you, like, oh, this is a movie that like that fountain pen stood out kind of a thing with Back to the Future I think about, I don't even like this movie. I saw it that much. I saw it once, um, Inglorious Bastards mm-hmm. with, um, uh, what's his name? The director that- Quentin Tarantino. Uh, Quentin Tarantino. Yeah. Um, so in the beginning of that movie, it's like 12 minutes in or something like that. Um, when uh, Hans Landa, Landa is like filling his pen very ceremoniously as he's like taking over that house or whatever. If you haven't seen the movie, it's I have. I, did, I, I only saw it once. He like um, very ceremoniously is like, takes out his bottle of ink. He's like basically takes over these people's house and goes and like shoots them all. But, oh yeah, yeah, you know, I do remember. That was the so first he, scene, wasn't go, it? It was the first opening yeah, scene. Yeah, I remember that. He sits in, he like has his bottle of ink, mm-hmm. he gets out his pen, it's a button filler. So it like stands out very obviously as mm-hmm. like he's filling his pen and then he writes this letter, you know, and I was like, oh, that absolutely is a fountain pen. And An actual that was one functioning where, like, fountain the pen. Fa- the, the fact that it was the ceremony of filling the pen with ink added to the like kind of chilling like um, theme of that yeah. scene. And so that's why it stood out to me. Yeah. And I, again, like you, I went and tried to research like what pen is that? And it was the same kind of thing. Some people theorize, but they don't really know. Yeah. Like it was a bottle of, it was a modern bottle of Pelican ink that he used which wouldn't have been the ink of the period, by the way. Well, ah. Pelican as a brand certainly would have been, you know, they're from Germany, so that would have made a lot of sense at that time. But it wasn't a Pelican pen, you know, so there's a couple theories out there about what it is, but it's not not definitive. Yeah. But, you know, at least like the, the, the ritual of using the pen was befitting such a scene. If you're evil. Well, yeah, it added to like <laughs> the the methodical kind of meticulous yeah. nature of his character and i was like that was like a good use of a fountain pen yeah for that scene and it yeah. would have been you know relatively time appropriate for what was going on too yeah but yeah i don't have any like pens that have been used in pop culture that i'm like oh this is the pen yeah pen for me it's mostly like world war ii movies they show up in yeah i don't know that this like as you know i'm thinking like what would else like maybe something for mad men like that would be an era yeah. where there might be some props and they were like pretty i don't remember seeing a lot good. of mad men I mean, but i think of like all the world war ii movies i've seen like yeah. i know in valkyrie i saw one yeah you know, i was yeah. like oh look a desk blotter oh look an inkwell you know I, yeah. I, I keep an eye out for that sort of stuff but yeah yeah i don't have an extensive knowledge of that and even even the pens of that era would have all been like hard rubber like maybe some sort of black yeah you know pen lever filler maybe some button filler something like that yep. you know so it like would be hard to distinguish what pens those even were yep. so anyway i'm curious if y'all have any feedback if you know like specific movies or shows where the pen is like any kind of a prominent thing that'd be kind of cool yeah for yeah, sure let us know all right question number three this week is from blonde scales mm. ever thought about doing a goulet exclusive fountain pen that's under 100 dollars? Hey, we've never done that uh perhaps a classic <laughs> kaveco sport I've seen other pen companies do one with Kaveco. Why not Goulet? 
Why not? Why not, Brian? Because we haven't done it yet. Oh, <gasps> oh my God. We've talked about it. We have talked about it. I think yeah. the last time we talked about it, we were like, okay, well, yeah, we could, but like, what color? Kaveco's like already got the, yeah, all yeah. the colors. Like, what, what would we be, you know, what would we win by having another Kaveco and putting her, slapping our name on it? Yeah. Like, I don't know if we could... If, we could do one we of those crazy about, like, like pearlescent ones. That'd be cool, but I don't know if they do that. I think that was kind of the idea that we were thinking about was something along the lines of the like iridescent like pearl one that they did. Um, they probably wouldn't like, do that because they, they'd want to sell like I know, right? A, so they want to sell those to everybody. I mean, other, other people have done them, but they've always been just kind of like flat, plain colors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and we've we've had. Um, I, it's interesting because like we don't we don't deal directly with Kuwaiko very much. We don't no, really we have know a distributor. much about them. So we don't have like a deep personal relationship with them. So like just doing exclusives with them is kind of a different process than maybe some of our other um, manufacturers who we've, you know, been able to establish a, a, a more personal relationship with over the yeah, years. Yeah, like with Banu, like we go directly through Banu. We've got a good relationship yeah, with yeah. them. With Kuwaiko, we don't, it's not, a, like, it's not a direct connection. Yeah, like we, we've, toured facilities for like Lamy and Aurora and Monte Grappa and yeah. uh, a bunch of others, you know, so it's, there's more direct well, we definitely, We definitely there. could, like that. the option's yeah, not, it's not it's unavailable not like we, to us. Yeah, but I, I will I say- just, I don't know what we'd do. I, th I will say like anytime you're getting into like much lower price pens, like the like the Quaco Sports and stuff like that. Quantity. The quantity yeah. of the purchase goes way up if they're even open to doing them because they usually have a production schedule, you know, and it's like the, the, it's like anything else, the economies of scale in order to do something special at a low price point, you have to do a lot of them. And then it's like, well, then, then we would have to really nail it with the color. Otherwise we're going to have these pens for five years. And you know, it's like, you kind of have to weigh that out. And I think for us, Quaco pens are sometimes very hit or miss for us. Yeah. Sometimes they do well, but the Quaco sport, like it sells, but it's not like a, gangbusters pen for us so that's yeah. that's part of why we haven't like pushed for that pen as an exclusive you know it's kind of just a multitude of factors it's not that we're opposed to it but it's just like never come up as the most obvious one of like oh we've got this really great color idea you know we can work directly with them they're excited about it that kind of thing it's just kind of like ah there's just like more resistance to that process so it's not like we're violently opposed to it but um yeah so i'm, I'm open to ideas about that what would you guys want to see that hasn't been done before. What, I, yeah, what I'd like to see it. is go back in time and erase the uh, Iguana Blue All Sport mm, okay. and then do that as an exclusive. There you go. Let's do that. That would be amazing. That sounds pretty awesome. Like, oh man, that pen. It would have to be an All Star, uh, All Sport, right? Those are the those are the ones that actually do do well. The All Sport. Well, they they can be hit or miss too, but they've done. They have come out with some pretty good colors of that. Do you know? So that's you know, was one of their best us. ones. What's that? The brown one. Golden espresso, Brian. Yes, that was a banger. If you take a brown pen and give it a coffee theme, ah, it does well. Yes, that actually is pretty common. Like of all the pens that have come out, like different brands, the Edison all the coffee theme ones, cappuccino, uh huh, or Banu iced latte. Mm. The uh, um, no wait, the, I'm thinking of the Lamy All Star. That was toffee. That no, was coffee. coffee. It was coffee? Yeah, it was coffee. All -Star. Coffee All Star. Yeah. yeah. Coffee All Star. Yeah, I'm telling you, call it coffee. You don't have to. Well. I'm, I'm with you, man. Give us some coffee. Um, you but betcha. I, but I will say though, like, uh, so you're the beginning of your question there, Blunt Scales was, you know, have we ever thought about doing a sub hundred dollar Goulet exclusive? Yes, we have done many of them. Um, you know, less so in some ways recently, but we have some actively right now on our site. You know, we've got we've done a bunch with Retro Fifty One in the past fountain pens. We've done a fountain and roller. Uh, we've done a lot of Conklins, all Americans, Duragraphs, other various Conklins and Monteverdes too. Um, we may or may not have a exclusive Monteverde in the works actually. Um, we have the Diplomat Magnum Prismatic Purple. Mm -hmm. That one is an exclusive of ours that we've had for several years. Uh, the Lamy Vista I think Black. It might just be in a US exclusive on that one. The Prismatic Purple? I think it's- It was definitely our exclusive. I think we I think we have a US exclusive Did it on open up? No, it was our exclusive for a oh, long okay. time. Maybe yeah. I'm wrong. Yeah, let me double check on that. But I, I mean, sometimes that changes. Sometimes we get an exclusive on it and then they choose to open it up. You know, we might get an exclusive for a while and that might've been the case. But anyway, the Prismatic Purple has been one. So yeah, there, we're, we're definitely into doing that as much as we can, but it is tough because, you know, getting for honestly half the time, it's just a matter of in a sub hundred dollar pen, it comes down to economies of scale for the manufacturer. 
are we buying enough pens to make it worth their while to make something special for us? So it's rarely like we don't like making, you know, sub hundred dollar exclusives. It's literally just not often an option for us. So we do try to jump on it when we can. Yeah. All right. Uh, that's it for that question. Okay. Drew. What? Ready for the next one? Nope. Lost in Spice. Uh, though I've been a fountain pen lover for a long time, I've finally decided to go to my first pen show. And I'm diving in headfirst, making it to the DC Super Show in August, which we'll be at. See you there. Any advice for somebody who hasn't attended a show before? I've watched Mike, Mike Madison and Fig Boots takes and wondered what you guys thought. I'm familiar with convention life and I've been attending Dragon Con for 20 years, but this is a whole different kind of event. Drew, you've been to a bunch of pen shows. I, I don't know if you can call it a bunch. So, so like, I'm very hesitant to answer this one. And I selected it because I, I want to, I, I get asked it a lot. Mm -hmm. Well, um, you are the expert, right? No. I hear you say no, it all the time. You're like, the, I go to the, all the no, shows. That's why I don't want to answer it. I am the authority it. on pen God, shows. God, no. Right? So Adrian was asking me like, hey, I think we should do a video on like, you know, things to remember for a fountain pen show. I'm like, I don't have any advice. I don't know what I'm doing because the more you go to these things, the more you realize other people go way more and know way more and prepare wait, 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 far wait. better. The more you go, the more you realize other people go more than you? Yes. That's what you're telling me? Yes. Well, somebody's got to be going the most, right? It's it's all the hobbies on Instagram. Okay, she, fair enough. She goes <laughs> everywhere. Or like uh, the, the vendors who are working the shows. Yeah, they yeah. go to all of them. Yeah. They um, have incentive to go. Yeah. But no, uh, so I don't. I don't feel like I'm an authority. I don't prepare. I'm. I just. Freaking, you don't have to be an authority. I, you know, I know, but, like, but but so many people are. Like I would say that trust Mike Madison from Ink Ink Dependence and you know David from Fig Boot far more than Brian or I. Like they 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 have their stuff together way more than we do. I. That's true. Like Brian hasn't been in four or five years. It's been like, four years. And then yeah. even then, it's only been to you know. I have been to a bunch. I've been to over a dozen shows. Yeah, and and so I have I've been, been to a bunch, but but still. yeah, and I've probably been to an equivalent or more and I still like, no, I don't. Well, and I will say too, the re the reason I would say we're not probably the most, the most credible way to like get that insight is because we're in the industry. And so like the things that we're going there to do and the things yes. that we're going to look at are, are probably very different than, yes. you know, you as a, That's like, another reason. A, a hobbyist enthusiast. So somebody like a Fig Boot or a Mike Madison, like they would have a better perspective on an enthusiast going to this kind of thing. Like, but what I will say, I've got some, I've got some thoughts and advice yeah. that I don't feel absolutely ashamed about, you know, but I will, I, I'm with you. I would not say that I'm like, I'm the authority. No, on this. no. And like, we, we don't like, if, if you're going to look at pens and potentially buy a pens, like we're, we we do not do that. So we go to engage, to converse, to meet and, you know, well, we don't just, tend to do that. I've definitely done that. Plenty of times. Didn't done what? I bought plenty of pens at shows. Oh, if not, I see really cool stuff, I'll, I'll, not, I'll, I'll I'm opportunistic. Not me, not me. I, I just, I freaking just wander around. I, I, yeah. I show up, make opportunities, but I, I don't even carry a bag most of the time. I don't carry anything with me. I don't prepare. I don't plan. I just. You don't need to if you have enough cargo shorts pockets. Oh my god. Um. <laughs> so yeah, I'm definitely not an authority there. The one, one thing I will say is that, um, and I know that you're going to get to this a little bit. It's extremely inconsistent, which you know, venues accept what type of money to get into the event and yeah. also even more inconsistent as to which vendors take what sort of payment. So just be mm -hmm. prepared with a bunch of different payment options, bring some cash, have Venmo, you know, set up and, you know, uh, you, you, know, have, have you have almost have to think of, kind of like a doomsday prepper going to a pen show. You have to think like if the entire like thing just collapses, how would I still get done what I'm trying to do? Yeah. So but, like have, but, a, have but, uh, a lot of backup options. But the way I see it, like I, 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 I sometimes feel like over preparing is stressful, so I I don't know. I, I just would say if you if if you like to prepare, watch the videos that you mentioned. I'll I'll link you know um you know mm. Mike and uh, Fig Boots videos in here, so you can go and check those out. Mike's got a video on how to pen show, and then Fig Boots got a video called Pen Show One on One. Both very well thought out, very nice. well crafted. I don't think I've seen those. And I have to check them out. Based in legit you know experience. Yeah. Um. So uh, if you like to be prepared, check out their videos, be prepared. I would say, who cares? I, I, don't, I don't like being prepared. I, I like to go unencumbered and absorb the atmosphere, be around friends that I've never met before, um, find the people I know, meet new people that I didn't know previously, 
and be a part of this community that if you are the only person that you know that's into this sort of thing, just being around it, you know, absorbing the environment and, you know, seeing the energy and the passion around you, like that is the biggest deal for me. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. you can walk around, take a look at some stuff, like, but be surprised. You don't have to have a game plan for everything, you know, you know, do a lap around, then do a lap in the middle and, you know, just keep on going until you're tired and done and want to go to bed. That's, that's what I do. <laughs> but enough. I don't know, you've got more here, so I'll turn it over to I you. Do have, I do have some more thoughts. I, yeah, I don't, yeah. don't listen to me. Well, you're you're already going to be better than what I'm doing. So yeah, I pretty much just added this on so I can say, don't listen to me. Well, I think I think your advice is good for like if you're going to a pen show for the experience and for like the social aspect of it, because honestly, that is a big part of it. Especially if you go to a bunch of pen shows. I mean, at some point, you just go and you're like, it's just tables and tables of pens and pens and pens, and they all kind of blend together. Yeah. But getting to meet the people is yeah. so cool. Yeah, like, and it doesn't so have it doesn't the, have to be a big production. Like, yeah, it doesn't. You know. It doesn't. But it's like I understand if it's your first show. Yeah, but this person's like, already been to Dragon Con. Line. Like it's not going to be as crazy as Dragon. Well, that was Con. that was. I've never been to like a big. That's a that's a huge convention. Anything with the name Con in it is going to yeah. be way more than anything yeah, you're going to experience so at any pen you're, show. You're good if you've done that. You know. 20 times and the fountain pen shows are going to be not a big deal. Yeah. So I, so I do have some thoughts. Um, Drew's right. I haven't been in four years. I haven't been since COVID, but I went to every DC show since 2009. Before that, I've been to Atlanta and San Francisco and that's it. Um, so there are definitely ones I haven't been to. Drew, you've been to more types of shows, but I don't know. You're probably, you might've been in more shows than me at this point. You're catching up. But probably. I started I, mean, going, I, I went to, you know, I started going to every, I haven't missed a DC show since I started going. Okay. Um, which, which was in like 20. I have no idea. When was that? 16? Like, no, I think earlier was than earlier that. Earlier than that? Yeah. Yeah. You've been, I mean, whatever, but you've been a bunch. I remember, so. I remember I was at the first show that, uh, Canalea showed up to. Okay. Whenever that was. That was a minute ago. <laughs> it was a minute ago. Yeah. Uh, I remember, I remember they, that was a big deal. Was Everybody a big was like, oh my God, have you seen these? That's right. That's right. Yeah. Brooks Rosen. There you go. Yep. Um, so my advice, be flexible and patient. Most pen shows are pretty grassroots organized. They are not as polished and pretty much anything like with a con name in the name of it that you've been to, it's it's not going to be at that same level. Um, plan on devoting a pretty good chunk of time to going to these shows because there's going to be a lot of pens to look at. Um, even if it's a relatively small show, pens are small and you can fit a lot of pens on a table. So even if you don't have, you know, all that many vendors there, there's still a lot of individual items that you can look at and it takes a while to get through it all. Um, wear good shoes. It helps maybe to think about packing a lunch or some snacks or at least having them like in your car or in your hotel room or whatever. Um, because there's not, most of the times when they're held at some of these hotels are not the most like in the heartbeat of the city kind of places. And there might be a restaurant or a bar attached to the hotel, but pretty much anything within walking distances of the hotel is going to be overrun by people at the show. So it's just easier if you just can take care of most of your food and, and needs on your own. I like driving far away and taking breaks. That is also an I just option. like getting out. That anything is, to, I, I like that reasons to escape. Too. Yep. Well, that's an option too. I get worn out. Yeah. Also finding a dark corner somewhere. Yeah. With a bench where there's no light. It's funny because yes. fountain pen shows specifically, it's a lot of introverts. So everybody gets like a little anxious okay, it's being around good. so many people. It's always good to find a secret area. Everybody loves everybody loves being there and everybody's really nice, yeah. but it's just a lot for kind of everybody. So it is yeah. kind of interesting to seeing how people yeah, find, find a bathroom that no one knows about. Yeah, that there helps. Um, yeah, so just make, just make sure you're comfortable. Make sure you have comfortable clothes and stuff like that. Um, I would say get there early, especially if you want to get any nib work done or any other like services that are available from people at the show. Those lists usually get up pretty quick. Um, and if you don't get on the list quickly, it'll fill up for the whole day. And well, then a lot of them are already filled it. up. They do that beforehand, oh, that's before true. the yeah. show. They do it before the show now, so yeah. you've, you've already missed your chance. But you never know. You if might you're going, be able to, if you're going to D.C., I think that um, Matthew Chen takes uh, walk-ups. Okay. So, uh, it was a lot more common back years ago when I was going more regularly to yeah. not have signups in advance, but I feel like that's maybe a more recent thing that they've done just yeah. out of necessity. Um, I would say go to, if there are like specific independent pen makers or independent people who are there, go to their tables first, because a lot of times they'll have one of a kind stuff that they make and bring to the show that they've maybe been working on for a while. And once it sells out, it's gone and 
if you get there in the afternoon, it might be like their table's empty, you know, because they've sold all their stuff. Um, if you're totally new and you're not sure what's going on, I would say don't linger too much at any one table first. Kind of like what Drew said. It's like, take a lap, just go around, scope, scope out everything and don't spend too much time lingering in any one place and then go back and hit the places that you found most appealing, if you can remember. Um, I would say bring your pens with you for comparison because you might have a pen and be like, oh, I really like this pen, but you know, you're picking up all these other pens, you're gonna forget a bunch of stuff. But if you have your pens with you, you can like compare and have nib size comparisons and stuff like that. It can be helpful to reference that. But probably the best tip I've gotten from people is um, bring a notebook so that if you're testing out different pens and nibs and stuff like that, because a lot of times people will have, you know, they'll ink up stuff at their table and let you try them out. So if you keep your own notebook and you write down which pen you're using, which nib size, maybe which ink or whatever, and what you think about that pen, then once you leave the show, you'll have this notebook filled with all these different things that you got to test out. And that helps your experience a lot without having to like buy all these pens. So that's a really handy tip. Um, and then a lot of fun happens after hours. So <clears throat> if you stay at the hotel, if you're traveling far, or if you can linger afterwards, go to the bar, go to the lounge or whatever is happening at the place, there's usually, that's where people like us, you know, pen addicts, you know, whatever, bloggers and other like vendors from there, you know, manufacturers, reps and stuff like that. A lot of them are hanging out after hours. You will get to see all these people who you interact with online, you know, who are producing content in a very concentrated fashion. Everybody will be low key. And a lot of times people have like their massive pen collections out and they're like trying them out, trading them out. So you're gonna get to try in a more low key setting. A lot of that, if you're able to make it to those after hours things. So those are my, those are my show hacks. There you go. Cool. All right. All right. Last question. Finishing it off. Let's see who is this person. Dang it. Kathy Fannin. Kathy is asking you, Brian. Okay. Kathy says, I've been watching old pen casts from the beginning. Mm. And one of them. Seven days. Brian mentioned his 20 pound backpack. Yep. Would Brian consider doing a what's in my backpack segment? I don't know that it's 20 pounds at the moment. It's a little more if I have my laptop in it. Oh, yeah, that's a heavy computer. Are we considering doing a what's in my backpack segment? That's up to you, my friend. I'll do it if that's interesting. If it's nothing inappropriate in there. I don't think so. You don't have any... I didn't prep anything. So kidnapped you're gonna Oompa see Loompas or anything in there? Not that I'm aware of. Maybe Excellent. stowaways that I'm not aware of. That's fine. Okay, because people... You know, I can just, just kind of blow through and show you. Well, so I'm a, I'm a big fan of the Swiss gear just because it's got pockets galore. This is like your fourth Swiss gear backpack, yeah, right? Yeah. I've you, had many iterations of You've them. also had I times, love lots of pockets. You've also had times where you've bought the same backpack twice. I've done that many times, yeah. Because they change them. Yeah. This iteration of it, I'm not in love with as much as the last yeah, one. Yeah, I, I remember your old one. You had you yeah. had like, what, three of those like back to back? I bought a couple of those. Have yeah. you ever bought two of them at the same time? Yes. You have? I did that with my last backpack. Just because you knew that you're going to want the same one later? Yeah. And then you know what? <laughs> Next time I needed it, it was not available anymore. Have you tried like eBay get or get one used? I, I don't really care that much about it, I guess. Oh, okay. No, I haven't tried that. That would make sense. Okay. For as much as I care about using it every day, and I use it every day, I don't know. I'm just maybe not, you should care. I'm not one of these gearheads. I just like I've got to get specific. You are about some things. I'm very inconsistent, I guess. <laughs> apparently. All right, what you got? In I really there? just want a lot of pockets. Um, All right, is, did you have anything that was this weird side pocket here? This this is where my water bottle or okay. coffee lives. Wait, there's there's so, a little there's a little snowflake on that thing. Yeah. Is that insulated? Well, okay. This is something I've never used as a feature in this backpack. Oh, look at that. You can unzip it. It's a space it's, pocket. It's got like an insulated thing in here. Oh. Why? I don't know. It's there. <laughs> I'd, it's probably I'm not for a like, water bottle. It looks water bottle it's shaped. It's too small for a water bottle. It's too small like, for your water a bottle. A really small water bottle. I drink a lot of water. I can't like... It's I, not big enough. I bet you'd get that in there if you really tried. I don't care about this feature. <laughs> But, and it's also got like <laughs> extra buckles and stuff. Like I'm not, I'm not going on a hike in this thing. You know what I mean? Oh, so like, I don't no. need this buckle anyway. But Dude. I do like to have there you go. a water bottle okay. that I can stick in there. But when I have my, like my real water bottle, which is like a 24 ounce thing, it, it's a little tall. And so sometimes it's like, and it kind of falls <laughs> out in the car and stuff like that. My old one was a little higher and I felt sturdier. Like this thing is going to be the thing to fail for sure. Yeah. Um, what do I have in here? Look at how sturdy that top handle is though. You've yes. got like steel braided 
This is cable. part of what I do like about this because it's it's heavy and I that is legit. And it's like super padded and stuff like that. The padding on the shoulders is pretty good too. But again, more buckles. Like good lord. <laughs> anyway, so what are, the, what are those st top straps? They have symbols on them. These. So this this part is stretchy under here. So it's just like a firm strap. Oh, so the arrows show that it stretches out, up and down. To max out the stretchiness. Oh. So it's got some give, but it's also got a stopping point. That's what okay. that's all about. Yeah, and it's got an extra little hook on this part so that if you're, you know, dealing with the two different parts. <laughs> there you go. But <laughs> another thing I'm not as crazy about with this one, <laughs> I'm telling everything I don't love about this backpack. Yeah. The zippers go like all the way down. Oh, that's weird. So if I have my laptop in the back, and it I just pick fall. it up. Oh my God, whoa, you got which, a battery pack coming yeah, out. Yeah, so it's it's made to be so that you can fold it open I mean, like that, this. that could be cool. But that's rarely something that I desire. Because look at this, <laughs> what am I gonna do with this? Anyway, I normally keep my laptop here. I've got a folder, it's purple, I don't care. It's just like a sturdy like plastic folder so that the papers, oh, yeah. because I'm one of those people, even in my adult life, but ever since childhood as a kid growing up, I would get like a homework assignment, put it in my backpack, other stuff would get shoved in. And then like Friday morning, I would find this crumpled up, undone thing of homework. And I'm like, tag on it. And it's I my son's backpack I'm every day. I'm still like that to today. Yeah. I keep a folder, so I keep hack. a folder in my bag. I, it's, a, it's got yeah. sharks with wings on it. Oh, cool. And it says Archer Brown on the, <laughs> on the sticker. Child. That's awesome. Uh, I don't think I stole it actually. I think I bought it from me. And then Shannon put a label on there because she assumed it was for him. I was like, no, that is my shark. Oh, there nope. you go. <laughs> that's my shark folder. Love it. Uh, Rodia pad. There we go. Love the love the 16. Classic. Hard to go wrong with 18, that. 18, 18. I have a battery pack. Pretty A pretty stout one. Yeah, man. This is like a 2,000, 20,100 milliamp. That'll get you going. So it'll do a lot. Um, it's got a little pocket for it. This backpack technically has a USB plug. Oh, look at that. So if you're like flying or something, it's got a cord in here. Uh, here we go. A cord in here that what? The mic, you're pretty far away oh, from it. Oh, sorry. Is this better? <laughs> um, you plug the cord into the battery pack and then you can Have you charge. ever done that? Have you ever used that? No, I always no. forget that it's there. <laughs> but this cord gets in my way all the time. <laughs> We're making you hate your backpack. <laughs> um, what else do I have in here? Oh, I've got some of these that I forgot about. Ooh, like yum! Sour strips. This is given to us by somebody we know, and I wanted to give it to my kids, and it fell into my backpack, and I forgot that it was there. Um, this is like my my go-to carry around notebook. There you go. We got a two thousand in travelers, there. Travelers, travelers notebook. I got a two thousand with several different Goulet notebooks in there. So this is a go-to. I keep like personal and business stuff. So if I like therapy or some doctor's appointment or something, I'll carry that with me because it's not, you know, I can like throw that in a a pocket. Any number of pockets I have on my person. Any number. Okay. Other side, it's also got a compartment here Jeez. that I never use. I don't even know what this is for. <laughs> oh, I think it's <laughs> I think it's intended so that if you have like like <laughs> wet or dirty clothes, you can like that shove it. It goes back so it goes, far. It goes all the way. I'm like, this is the other side. What of the, the heck? Thing. Anyway. That's so a I guess cavern. if like, it's a tunnel. I sweat a lot, so if I like change, needed to change my shirt and shove it in there, I could. I think that's what it's for. What the heck? Okay, let's keep going. Oh my god, yeah. This is why it weighs so much, is because of all this stuff. I've Jeez. Got. Um, so in this part, it's got like a couple of different pockets. So I've got just computer cords and various things. What's this floppy thing? Oh, we're getting there. Oh my god. What else have I got in here? Got a pen case. Is there There's anything no, in there? No pens in no it pens at the moment. In there. Okay, just an um, empty pen case. Bag of cashews from the last time I flew somewhere. <laughs> that I have yet to eat, but they're still good. <laughs> what else have I got? A bag of cashews. Empty bag, empty probably bag. a sandwich that I had in there at some point. <laughs> um, so this this little floppy part, it's a hard case that's okay. intended for like sunglasses. Sunglasses, okay, yeah. But what do I have in there? Uh, Not that, sunglasses. Is that toothpaste? I got hydrocortisone cream <laughs> because we'll get there with the what's happening. But I got into some poison ivy, oh, so that's no. what that's going on. Two two tubes of hydrocortisone. You'll, you'll like this, Drew. This what is my, the heck? This is Brian? my life hack. This is uh, a little pen like sleeve thing that we got. It's got, it says Yaffa Brands on yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, and these are these are tums. They just like fit perfectly in this little pen tube, and I don't have to carry around a whole. They look thing like of tums. Mentos. I thought tums were like. Flat oh, no, on man. the edges. No, these are good. These are like berry flavored, and yeah, they're 
They're legit. So I keep so you put a stack there. of Tums in a, a stack Yafa of Tums. pen tube. I do have sunglasses in there. There you oh go. God. What else have I got? You've had those for a while, haven't you? I got you? some pens. Oh, I have many of these. These are my five dollar <laughs> Home Depot <laughs> checkout specials. I keep like I have like ten of those. <laughs> I've seen you wear those for years. I, I always assume they're the same pair. No, I keep <laughs> I have many of them because they're five dollars and they break and then whatever I lose it. Um, I got a Retro Fifty One <laughs> Chapino. I got Lamy, another Lamy 2000, oh different nib size. What else have I got? We have two 2000s in there. I've got um, my- There we go. Yep, Prussian uh, blue. Prussian blue, yep. 580, 580. ALR. Now that case, you have had this that case. Is the OG. I have seen, he has had this case since I first got the job here. Uh, this was in his garage with uh -huh. a Schaefer 300 in it. That's right. It was a Schaefer the 300 one. with rouge hematite. Yeah. Yep. And I remember seeing that oh, pen. Oh, that thing like. Man. Oh yeah, it did. Yeah. I remember seeing that pen and be like, whoa, fountain pen. That's right. This thing is so thin now. Man. It's seen some It's like leather paper. I would carry that around in my pocket a lot. Jeez. That's like my it's like my go-to single sleeve. All right. Oh, we got some. All right, so in my front pocket now. This is where things are gonna get really interesting. I see a okay. Rubik's Cube. Um oh yeah, I got a couple in there, I think. So this is a um this is a something kind of cool. It's a it's a, like an EEG headband, so it's like a meditation type thing. Oh, it like okay. Reads your brain waves as you're trying to meditate. It's very gadgety and very cool. Okay. So I've been trying that out, um, and I can scientifically say that this I have, is this is why Brian, I have no chill. This is why Brian is so calm and measured is because of his meditation headband. No, I can I can scientifically prove that my mind never shuts off. <laughs> I did it. I had uh, I gotten some like. Did you break um, it? No, I got started it. smoking. So I, um, <laughs> I've tried acupuncture a couple of times, um, and I tried it on. I think it was yesterday, actually. Yeah, it was. This was yesterday. So I did it for like an hour. Uh, you know how long out of an hour that my mind was in a calm state? Oh my god, three minutes. One percent of the oh time. Oh my god. <laughs> that's because they were. That's because they weren't using extra fine I'm pilot sitting, nibs. I'm sitting in a dark room with no stimulation, and my mind is just going. Oh Go my figure. god. Um, what else we got? I'm on a lot of different like health supplement things. Great. So this is like one of those pill things for yeah. the week, but I have to have, it's actually for the day because I have so many different times of the day and all that kind of stuff. Nice. I do have a Rubik's Cube, one of my go-to classic three by three. Oh, I see more than one in there. As well as there a you. nine by nine, <laughs> which I will also solve. That's more fun on planes and stuff because it's not as clacky and it takes more time to solve. Oh my God. What else have I got? I got some uh, Robert Oster Blue Water Ice. I like this because it's a 30 mil bottle, so you can fly with it, and it's under the like size. And it's plastic, so it's not going to shatter. It's plastic, so you don't have to worry about it, so yep. I just keep it in my bag all the time. All right, this is over halfway empty, too. What else have I got? I got a, this is an old school Visconti case. It is. Three pen case, which has some of my more recent pens. I think I had my one of my Lamy 2000s oh, yeah. in here. I got to be Eco Heat. That's right. Which is new, and then I got the um, one we showed last time, the Yukari Royale the Vermilion. Beautiful. Got that in there. What else we got? Another pair of sunglasses. Is it the same pair? Slightly different. These Slightly. are dark this blue. Is more navy. Oh Five dollars though. Um, what else we got? <laughs> Cliff Bar. <laughs> There's so much stuff in here. This this is more of a catch-all. I got various dongles and <laughs> cables for stuff. Got some random medication stuff. Got some Excedrin. Oh my gosh. Um, a leave as well. There's so much. This a lot is of these endless. Is because, well, a lot of these there's so like, many pockets. There's so many pockets. I got some hand sanitizer. Can't go wrong. Some tissues. Icebreakers, breath mints as well. I am astounded. I knew there was going to be a lot of a, stuff in here. This I put in there recently. It's like a jump drive that I cleared out of my desk. This looks like it was free somewhere. Got a clothespin. Why do you have a clothespin? Because I just cleaned out my desk. Oh, this is funny. I have a 16 megabyte jump drive. Why? Because I just cleaned out my desk. So I just need to go home and make sure that that's empty and then I'll probably throw that out. If it's 16 megabytes, there's not gonna be anything important. A random snack clip, probably because I finished some food <laughs> item and have yet to bring that home. Um, cough drops, can't go wrong with cough drops. Oh I talk God. a lot. My voice That's your third Ziploc bag. Morning. I have a lot of Ziploc bags. Business cards for, you know, going to events and with talking the old, to people. Does that have the new logo on or is it the old it's one? The, it's the, it doesn't have a logo, it's just okay, a splatter. Good, okay. Yeah. What's that red thing? Red thing? Yeah. Oh, oh it's, it's just, just like a different a, color. It's like a mesh netting. Oh, okay. In I see. Pocket. All but right. A couple of masks because COVID. Yep. Another clip. random clip. Some of this is like stuff that like <laughs> I, I literally just cleaned out my desk mm -hmm. and I found random crap that I needed to bring home. So I just threw it in here and I Gotta just bring home those clips. I haven't taken it back yet. Another Ziploc bag? 
More cough drops. <laughs> you have two bags of Another cough drops. Another cliff bar. You have two Ziploc bags full of cough drops. I do. Um, and then this is uh, earbuds. Okay. Which this thing is kind of cool, right? Wait, don't so you use like, wireless earbuds? I have those as well. I keep those on my person. But these are the ones that like plug right into my phone. They are more reliable mm -hmm. for like yeah. actually talking on a microphone. So <laughs> I have those and I think that might be it. There's another like side pocket in here, but it doesn't, oh no, I do have something uh, in here. <laughs> There's another Ziploc oh, bag. Another clip bar. <laughs> oh, this one's in like pieces. <laughs> this one might be old. <laughs> What's the date on that thing? Uh, January 2023. This one's expired. Oh, so my God. That's not that bad, Maybe though. tossing that one. Oh, I, my God. When I cleaned out my desk drawer. Oh, no. To go with the cough drop thing, I found some cough drops that expired in 2013. What? We weren't even in wait, this wait, wait, building. In the, yeah. How did that move I don't with know. You? Oh I moved them. I moved expired cough drops. Wow. <laughs> do you? Do, I, I have never seen you even have a cough drop. Do you, do you? I'm covert about it. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's not like I'm eating cough drops all the time, but when I need them, I need them. You know. Yeah, I, mean? I never, I never catch you like crunching on it. Another cliff bar. bar. It's making me realize how many cliff bars <laughs> I throw in here and then don't end up eating. No, I will say. I need that to check the dates on all this January as well. I remember there being a box of cliff bars behind the original packing area in the garage. Like, yeah. You've been a long time. Cliff bars are good for just man. like when I'm like going and I don't really get lunch. Yeah. I have more tissues. <laughs> There you go. That's what's in my bag. Wow. And then usually my laptop as well. That is, I, I, you know, I, I, I'm surprised I didn't see like a hammer or some sort of, you know, there's a, there's hatchet. A, there's a logic to what I have going on here. Yeah. No, I mean, everything is very, I, I will say that there, there's practicality behind a lot of this, which is to be Most expected. Of it. Most I suppose. of it. Yeah. Most of it is like. This is kind of like what my life is like at home, especially is I own, I don't know, like 12 hammers because I will have a hammer, do a project. It'll get put away in like a cabinet or something like that. And then next time I go to use it, I'm like, where the heck is that hammer? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, dang it. I need to buy another I one. need another hammer because yeah. I, I'll spend 30 minutes looking for a hammer and not find it. So yeah, I just end up buying multiples of things that are oh not significant in price that I can just find. And I I just I love the fact that you've got the multiple five dollar Home Depot sunglasses. <laughs> that this is how I roll. That man. makes me so happy. That's how I roll. <laughs> two Rubik's cubes I do. At, with you at all times. An empty <laughs> an empty two pen three pen pouch. Oh my god. Yeah, that's because like I was those I was I was doing things with. The and pen. then a sixteen hundred dollar <laughs> fountain pen. That one's in the case. It's protected. <laughs> you know. I know. It's of all the things. You know, and, and all my medicine. Yeah, and then um, I'm collecting as I age. <laughs> I would definitely like if I was cleaning out my desk. If I found some random clips, I would not have been like, "Oh, this clothespin, I definitely need to bring home." This that would have gone. I probably in the trash. didn't need to bring this. I can. <laughs> I don't need that clothespin. <laughs> but like the chip clips and all these things, like no, I I we have like probably no less than eight bags of chips where it's like mostly crumbs left in it. <laughs> like every time we have something as a family or I have people over, I'm like, I throw out all the unopened uh. bags of chips and I'm like, we need to kill these things. And then like somebody opens the Kids new eat bag, your chip crumbs. they eat seven eighths of it. And then I'm like, we've got another bag mm. of crumb chip things. Anyway. Yeah, I'm lucky that Archer still can't reach certain levels of the pantry. So. Mm. You know, he can't open up a new box of cereal. I have to hide whenever food. he wants to. I have to hide food for my kids at this point. I know. Yeah. They can reach everything. Do they, they know any of your time. hiding spots? Like, do you like have to I'm create? I'm not saying. But like, have you had to, have you had to, uh, you know, kind of like, you know, clear out a hiding spot and move on to a different one? Like some sort of like safe house? No. Has, has any, no. so none of your safe houses have been compromised yet? No. Oh, no. all right. I also make it pretty clear with my kids, like if something is really important and I don't want them to eat it, they know. Oh, okay. They're, they're gonna. If, it, if this, if this food cause, looks like it's been problems. hidden, it's don't touch it. Well, there's some things that are kind of like, to give my kids credit. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Just realizing how ridiculous my life is. <laughs> so, you you know, we've talked about Swiss cake rolls. Of course. In this pen Yes, cast. you've got a process. So after I had one in here, we were just, so many people were talking about it. I was like, I really like some Swiss cake rolls at home. So I bought some, yeah. a whole pack. And it was like, I just bought them on a whim, which I often do at the grocery store, especially with sweets. And my kids were like, not really sure who they were for. Mm. And I was just eating them casually. 
and I ended up eating all but one pack of them <laughs> all myself because the kids didn't want to eat them without knowing like whose they were they or whatever. They knew. They looked different enough. They were like, wait, yeah. red flag. And there was one left. So I was like, I'll save that for the kids because there's two in the pack. They can split it. Yeah. But even still for like a week after that, it they didn't there. know whose it was all right. for. So they didn't eat it. So I was like, credit to the respect, kids. Respect, respect. Credit to the kids. But yeah, I, I'll hide food that I like that I don't <laughs> want them to eat just because it's easier. Oh, that I'll is put amazing. it like up on top of like the cabinet above the fridge because yeah. I'm a I'm a freak arm. Yeah, you know so I could definitely I, I could easily there. hide things from both Shannon and Archer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. above the fridge. That's that's, anyway. that's no man's land. That's where we, that's where we put all the peanut candy because Archer's allergic. Um, right. So I've got a couple Reese's yeah. cups up there. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Yep. None of mine's that serious, but it's more just like annoying. Wow, th Brian, that was an adventure. Thank you for sharing. This is my life. It just oh man, if we went to my house, we're not going to. But like, <laughs> it's like that multiplied by the square footage of my house. Oh it's, my god. It's an it's it's fun. That is amazing. It's wild. All right. Well, that that is our Q and A. There you go. Aren't you glad you asked? <laughs> we'll have um, yeah. yeah. Leave us some comments. Leave us questions in the in the YouTube's in the video. Yeah, what's the most random thing you have in your bag right now? Tell us that. Ooh, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, Entertain us. You can also email us at pencast at gulliapens.com if you're an audio listener. In which case, I hope you enjoyed that last segment because I don't know how that is going to work out in audio form, but probably good. It's lighthearted. Um, okay. Now we're onto the pen spotlight. Yeah, this will be fun. This will be fun along the theme of revolutions of the fountain pen world. We have Brian's handmade wooden pens. Kicking it old school, an actual <laughs> Goulet pen. Let's do it. Okay, so you want me to, you want me to show these, Drew? Is um, that what's happening? Hang on, let me clear my expired cliff bars out of the way. Yeah, I'm, I've got some, I've, I know I've got some questions. So. You got questions. Yeah, so let, let's let's look, this is the one. You want me to This show. is the one that I saw first. So this, this is a this, chonker. This big chonker. It's yes. got red stuff in it. So first of all, I want to know, this red stuff doesn't like, belong what is there, it? though, right? This is not wood. You it's did there. something to that this. That is wood. That is wood. The red stuff? It's all wood. So you this didn't, is, like, stain it or something? So this wood is, is um, the wood species is called box elder. Um, the reason it's got this crazy grain pattern to it is it's a burl. It's essentially this tumor that grows on the tree. So think about a limb, instead of growing straight out, just goes gnarled up into a big ball. And you right. end up with this crazy grain. So it's a burl from the box elder tree. And this is called um, double dyed. So what happened, I didn't do this. I bought the blank like this, but they basically inject dye into the oh, burl. Oh, okay. So they injected a purple dye and a red dye. So the white part that you're seeing there is the natural color of the wood. That makes sense. It's kind of like a, it's kind of like a whitish color with some kind of gray bluish kind of tones to it. The purple and the red is an unnatural dye that has been infused into the wood. It did look unnatural. It's then, that... it's then stabilized with like a resin stabilizer because the wood itself is very punky and wouldn't, wouldn't last it's very, very long. What? Punky. Punky. Punky, yes. That's like if That's you've ever a word? used Yeah, if you've ever had like wood, like a like a tree or a branch or something that's like super dried out and is really like soft and you know crumbly, that's punky. Punky. Yeah. How about that? P-U-N-K-Y? P-U-N-K-Y. Yeah. Oh my god. Like punky Brewster. I like that word. Punky wood. So it's a punker. Yeah, if you have a really soft wood, then um oftentimes you can you can infuse it through like vacuum and pressure, you can infuse it and then you bake it with this resin and it stabilizes the wood, essentially kind of makes it like the hardness and the stability of a, of a resin material, but you still get the natural look of the wood. So you bought, so the, I bought blank the blank and you, then you bought the kit. So the kit comes the kit. with- So the metal parts I did all not All the metal make. parts. Yep. Okay, so- That was, I believe are that- Are these like- I believe that kit was called the Majestic. Oh, well, I mean, kit. it looks quite majestic. You've got these- are these flowers or sunbursts? They or? are some kind of ornamentation. They might be so snowflakes. I'm not these sure. These metal bits, yep. do they um, have a inner sleeve that gets inserted into yeah. the wood? Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's there's more metal so what happens in the, here that in you order can't to, see. So the wood itself is not very strong, especially this thin. Um, so what you do is you drill a hole through the wood mm -hmm. and then you glue in a brass tube to give it internal strength. Ah. So the wood itself is really just a, a an outer coating. Okay, so this metal part connects to the brass tube. So that metal part is pressing into the end of a brass tube, ah. which is then encased in the wood. Is it glued shell. or screwed or? Um, you can press pressure fit them in there, but you can add a little glue just to sturdy it up a little bit. I bet you did, didn't you? 
I don't remember on the specific Because you had glue to your target but yeah, furniture. I would, I would glue it. Yeah, I would probably glue it. Brian, Brian, um, Brian's a add the wood glue to the Ikea sort oh, yeah. of guy. Any, any, <laughs> any assembly furniture like yes. that, throw a little wood glue on those dowels. Yeah, You'd man. be surprised how much it helps. That's a, that's a Brian, Brian Goulet original hack there. Okay, and then Heck we've yeah. got some some jewel in here. That is a Swarovski crystal, apparently. Did that? So that came with the that hardware. That came on the kit, so yeah. on the kit. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And this mm-hmm. is not a... Here, will you open it's that for me? It's a screw cap, yeah. But that's not a fountain pen, right? It's a fountain pen. It is? Oh, it is not no, a it's not a fountain pen. pen. Okay. <laughs> so the whole reason I got into the fountain pen thing is because you would buy kits like this as a pen maker. And literally the only difference between a rollerball kit and a fountain pen kit is this section here. So you you replace this with a grip and a fountain pen nib and like a converter and it's the same pen. So as a pen maker, you can make the body of the pen and then put a fountain pen or rollerball kit on Were it. there any kits that came with both? No, they always sell them separately. Oh, okay. So you would buy it. And this was like, back in the day, this, just the metal hardware for this was like 40 bucks. Jeez. Because, you know, Swarovski crystals don't just grow on trees. That's right. So you can imagine what I would have to charge for a pen like this by the time I have just the raw materials. And then the fountain pen version is more than the rollerball version. And then you have to do all the work of it and all that kind of stuff. So it gets up there. That's why I couldn't You didn't make it keep more. very many fountain pens, did you? Nope, I sold all the good ones because I had no money at the time. So, so we've got another- even this one is actually defective. Like it's a little, it doesn't close quite all the way oh. um, because I think when I pressed it or something, I think like this right down here, like it's it's actually s- broken right there. So it's a little wonky. So I couldn't actually sell it oh, and because I glued all the pieces in, I can't disassemble it. So, so- it's my own beautiful mess. Yeah, you only kept the ones that you weren't super in love with, unfortunately. I kept, I have like one you, or two pens. Didn't you say you bought one back from I didn't uh, buy one back. I had gifted my one to my sister-in-law and she ended up giving it back to me because it was like a few one of the few examples oh, of here's a, a fountain actual pen. good pen. Yeah, there's a fountain pen. Okay. So, the so. problem the problem with all these fountain pen uh, pens on a pen kit, you know, you're dealing with wood with a brass tube and all this kind of stuff. So like they're very thick, they're very heavy because there's a lot of metal components to it. So you end up with a really heavy pen. They all have shiny grips and stock, who knows, whatever the heck mass produced nibs. This so the was, nibs it's are- It's got like a little- uh, ink, Yeah, that ink. was like an aftermarket nib I bought from somebody who was like kind of known in the pen world. Well, the engraving is actually kind of cool. Yeah, it, it looks say like a Iridium quill. Point Germany yeah, on it. Yeah, it looks like a quill. Yeah, quill in a uh, little ink pot. I don't remember the site that I bought that from, but it was somebody who was kind of known for that. So what kind of wood so, is this? That is um, Red Malay Burl. I believe it comes out of Australia. Oh, cool. So I liked making a lot of burl woods and exotic woods because it's a relatively small amount of wood. So you can got, buy really expensive wood and do cool stuff with it. And I think the reason I kept this one is because the burl like either dried out or started what is to this? crack a little what, bit. Yeah, so what is got, this like, little twirl stuff. swirl that I'm seeing right here? Is that a crack? That's a that's part of the burl. Yeah, there's like you can see sort of a crack in there. Yeah. Oh, so I is that a crack I, in the resin or a crack in the wood? Um, probably both. Like, so I think on this particular pen, I actually the finish that I used was actually basically super glue. What? So it's, yeah, because super glue is cyanoacrylate resin, so it's basically like acrylic acetate, like that same type of resin that's in acetone. Um, so when you use super glue, part of the reason it smells a lot is because of the acetone. Um, it's got some other binders and stuff in there too, but you know, basically you take super glue and you spread it all over top of the wood, you sand it all down and you're left with a resin finish. Wouldn't so that's that like, a pretty common so method for finishing pens wow. in, in the handcrafted world. Jeez, I had no idea. Yeah, but the problem is if <clears throat> it's a very brittle finish that that super glue so if the wood moves at all which it expands and contracts then you can get cracking and stuff and this is the problem that i ran into as a as a pen maker of exotic woods is you have this exotic wood in an environment like ours in virginia the humidity changes a lot throughout the year temperature changes a lot you have wood which absorbs and expels moisture constantly even after long after the trees cut down but it's got a brass tube underneath it and the metal expands at different rates than the wood. And then you throw a finish on top of it like this mm. that doesn't really breathe or or move either. Then you get a lot of splits and cracks. So some of this is like I tried making stuff, but then I noticed it split and cracked, so I wouldn't sell it. So there you go. This one says Rachel Goulet on it. It does. That was laser engraved. So <laughs> at the time, my parents actually had a laser engraver I of all things because my dad's somewhat of a technophile. And... Um, yeah, so that that wood is made out of tulip wood. Um, oh, it's in the rosewood family. I've heard of that it's, one. That's a natural. That's a naturally the color of the wood. It's this beautiful pink, 
you know, in kind of a yellowish color. Um, and this wood was one of the first ones that made me realize I was uh, so allergic to <gasps> Urushiol. Really? And poison ivy. Does yeah. this have it in there naturally? Yep. Oh my um, God. Any, pretty much any wood in the rosewood family naturally has uh, Urushiol in it. So the reason I found out I was allergic to it is because when I made this, this was a pen that we made like very early on. I want to say 20, 2007, 2008. Um, that was like a corporate order kind of gift pen thing. Um, and when I was turning it, I had no dust collection or anything. And so when I was turning and sanding it and stuff, I ended up with sanding like dust and stuff that ended up all over my forearms um, as I was turning it. And the next day, I broke out in like a poison ivy rash oh, all over man. my forearms. And I was like, well, that's not great. Oh, man. Yeah, and since then I've had many exposures to poison ivy. And you did some yeah. non-wood pens too, Yeah, I see. yeah. So a... these types of resins, these are actually the same acrylic acetate like rods and stuff that you see made on, you know, mass-produced fountain pens. So is it so from- buy them in uh, blanks. What, what brand is that? Um, There's several different suppliers, oh, okay. um, but I would buy them through like whatever. <laughs> Whoever the, the seller was that was known in the pen turning world, but their supplier was probably, you know, similar. It's probably the same type of resin. Synthetica, you get. right? Isn't that one Synthetica of the Synthetica is one that I think supplies a lot. There's a few there's a few of them out there, but this is actually you know, this resin is actually really cool looking. It's kinda neat, right? Like a blue and purple kind yeah. of a thing. Um, but the challenge with these, if you get too translucent uh, I just filled up my phone. So Oh my gosh. Yeah. We're just gonna have to deal with that. Oh, well, well, we'll skip back to this one. So yeah. the problem is when you get to these types so, of resins and stuff <clears throat> on a pen kit, if it's too translucent, then you see like the tube underneath and the glue that holds the tube in and the various parts that you press in the end. So it just, you you end up being more limited than you are in like a fountain pen yeah. if you- And this has got another one of those little pen. quill things. Yeah, yeah. And it's okay, but it's like the plating <clears throat> on it's not that great. It's and very yellow. It's Yeah, it's just, you know. The materials you end up with are essentially kind of subpar and it ends up being really expensive because you have to pay a lot. You're essentially paying like retail prices for the raw materials to get it. Yeah. So it ended up being where I had to charge $150, $200 and even that was not really paying myself yeah. any kind of a wage. So I just never able to make it as a pen maker. Mad respect for anybody that can, but yeah. it's filled you with a lot of like retirees and hobbyists and stuff. Yeah, too. you still see a lot yeah. of these at like craft shows and things yeah, like that. Yeah, and people are just trying to like, like <clears throat> make make back their their hobby, you know, yeah. pay for the materials and stuff like that, which is cool. Um since there will be questions in the comments, yeah. Have you ever entertained making more pens out of like wood? Like the like these? Or or any any wood pens? No. No. I mean, I still have some of the like supplies and stuff like that to be able to do it. I'm not like anti kit pen, but I would never definitely never, never try to sell it. Yeah. That because you you totally yeah, you know, as a as a hobbyist, like, you know, you talked last week about how you're working on your bench, you know, you've made yeah. chess chess boards, you've made headboards, sure, sure. you know, you've made lots of different things. But yeah. you know, bowls, but never never pens. You haven't uh I could. I mean, I know how to do it. I made probably a thousand of them back when I did it in my day. But I think part of that is like, I made so many of them and I'm kind of like, yeah, it's not as novel to me anymore. So yeah. I don't know if I find a good reason or something, that'd be kind of cool. But yeah. yeah, I'm not opposed to it, but definitely I wouldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't do it in I any feel way like, that would like sell if, them or If anything. the interest was there, you would have done it by now. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Because I mean, you've had plenty of opportunities and you've you've played around with plenty of wooden projects. You know, yeah. you made that, you know, sofa table, the C, shaped yeah. thing you've done. Yeah. I a, welded an infinity cube. Yeah, thing like you've done sure. so many different things. Part of it is, yeah, I, I'm I'm inspired by things that I haven't done before. I yeah. just like the process of learning it and there's less for me to learn when it comes to making pens like these again. So yeah, I mean, I don't know, maybe I'll get inspired to do it one day. I kept all the materials because I'm a hoarder, but you know, maybe one day. Nice. We'll see. Very but, cool. Yeah. Well, thank you for all that right. trip down memory lane. Memory. We're getting all of my stuff today with my yeah. backpack and my pens. Getting and all up in Brian Goulet's personal there you stuff. Go, whether you like it or not. <laughs> all right. Speaking of personal stuff, I think it's time to go into what's happening here. Yeah. Uh, well, let's see. Last we spoke, we were about to have a half day off for mental health. That's right. So I went home and yeah. um, I had a couple options for what movie I was going to watch. I you know, made myself a carafe of coffee turned off all the lights, wanted mm. to absorb a movie. Um, and it was between Inception or Ooh. Aliens. Okay. Or, so what I've been doing is like, I've, I've, been, I've realized that where at one point anything 
you wanted to watch, you could find on Netflix or someplace. Now, it seems like it's all spread out. You can yeah. never find what you want to watch. So I've been going up into the attic and getting my old DVDs and Blu-rays no down. Way. I, I don't have, them. I have so many, I can't actually store them downstairs, but I have a little, mm. you know, basket that, you know, it fits into my entertainment center. So I'm just kind of like rotating through. I'll grab a bunch that I kind of would like to see mm -hmm. and then put a bunch back up in storage. So how many do you have? Is it like a substantial collection? Two large boxes. Okay. That's pretty decent. So probably, probably 100, 150. It seems um, like a lot to me, but yeah. It's, it's not as many reasonable. as I used to have. I used to have over 300. Wow. You know, I pared down a lot of them. But uh, so I did grab Inception. I grabbed Aliens. I mm -hmm. grabbed uh, Predator, a couple others. The second Sherlock Holmes movie, um, Game okay. of Shadows, because I recently watched the first one. So cool. I was tossing around those, and I ended up going with Inception because I know um, Oppenheimer's coming out soon, so I wanted oh, to watch yeah. a Nolan flick. I'd seen um, uh, uh interstellar recently so i still haven't seen that but i want to it's on my list it's so good and it's honestly, on my list of movies that i actually am going to see it holds point. up better than inception so i watched inception really? I, I enjoyed it you don't think inception but, holds up no what? um so Why vi not? visually uh at the time it was really impressive yeah and i think since then i've seen a number of movies do similar stuff like um, when you know that nolan made a rotating hallway for a fight scene, that scene becomes even more credible, for sure. incredible to watch. But like the whole city falling in half, like since Doctor Strange came out, they made that whole graphic, you know, times 10. So it lost its mm. kind of like, I've never seen that before sort of shock. Um, and then I think a lot of that movie, while it's done really well, relies heavily on the surprise factor of like oh my gosh is this a dream is this reality i don't mm, know and now mm. all that's kind of faded away you kind of know what's it's happening a lot of commentary on you it. you know what's and, gonna happen yeah, and yeah. you know uh none of it's a surprise anymore okay and um but interstellar it doesn't really rely on any like surprise or oh mm. my god you know it's got some but uh it's just the crafting of it and the story the the progression hmm. of it I think holds up a little bit better, and um, okay. But anyway, uh, so Making still seeing it because I like I like Inception. So no, I love Inception. No, I, I, it, it is it is. Interstellar is even better. Then I'm like, well, I, I definitely need to see it. In, now. Inception's fantastic. I think that I will not want to watch it again anytime soon, though, because okay. I. But it seems to have been watered down every time I've watched it, and I don't want to water it down any, any further. So okay. I'm gonna leave it alone for a while. Wait till you're old and senile and forget most of it. There you go, and then it'll seem new again. Boom, I, that that'll happen about plan. 40 Put it back days. up in the attic for a couple of decades, and yeah, you're good there to go. You go. Absolutely. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I told Archer, my son, that I would uh, have a Nerf battle with him if he cleaned <gasps> his room and his playroom, because you know we've got he's got both um, our bedrooms in our house are not very large, so. Mm. His room is basically large enough for a bed, his one shelf of Legos, and then his mm. dresser. That's yeah. pretty much it. Yeah. So all of his other crap needs to go into the other room. Yeah. Both of them are a mess all the time. So mm -hmm. I was like, if you clean that up, Sounds we can good. have a Nerf gun fight and you can destroy me. So we did. He did a great job cleaning up his room because yeah. he was properly incentivized to uh, punish his father. That's awesome. So we did that. Um, he what kind of Nerf? Are these like Nerf darts? No, these are, are Nerf. Those, uh, are they those well, little, yeah, no, like darts? Those little balls? No, no, no. Have no. you seen those? Because those are like. Those look painful. Yeah, those yeah, are no, like. Not doing those. No, these are the standard Nerf darts. Um, he does have a fully auto um, dinosaur thing that has a clip that you hold down the, like, it's, it's kind of like a minigun where you have to activate the spin function. Oh, right, right, right. And then there's a fire button. So he, oh my gosh. he turns it on. It's like. And it's just like pop, 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 pop. That sounds awesome. Yeah, so he kills me with that. That's great. Um, <laughs> uh, but that's fine. That's fine. I'm I, I'm more accurate than he is. But he had his base. I had my base. Um, nice. He insisted on turning all the lights off, and it was daytime, so I mean, it was still. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. But okay. Uh, he has a little like uh, rotating rave ball or whatever that has like lights on. It. He put that in the middle of the hallway, and I said, "Oh, hang on." So I got my wife's little Bluetooth speaker and I hooked it up to my phone and started playing the theme from uh, Metal Gear Solid 3. So <laughs> it's this awesome. really, it's it's uh, done by, did you ever see The Rock? Oh yeah, so I love that movie. You don't remember the theme, do you? Oh yeah, I remember that. Of course I remember that theme. Same composer, Harry Gregson Williams, did the theme from Metal Gear Solid. So it's, oh, it's that's this, awesome. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, like, it's, it's like very epic music, dun, dun, yeah. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> so, but it starts off with like this kind of like James Bond, like 
sneaky sound, but then it goes, bum, 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 you know, and it picks up. So the whole time we were playing, that was like booming in the background. So it was That's nice, awesome. epic. Um, you know, I won't say that I didn't try, but I definitely took more risks than I needed to. So he definitely lit me up pretty good. <laughs> so, Part uh, of the fun. You know, and, and obviously to make it more fun, every time he hit me, I started running away so he could shoot me even more. <laughs> because, you know, these kids, they'll just like run straight at you and just like boom, 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 boom. Like, yeah. you know, if, if both people do that, it's not fun. So yeah. I had yeah. to play the coward. So <laughs> uh, that was fun. I uh, definitely, you know, amidst the sound and the fury of the fight, I heard various things crack and pop in my oh, body. So, <laughs> you know, pretty, pretty, you know, par for the course there. Yep. Uh, we also watched uh, Hellboy, um, the Guillermo del Toro's okay. Hellboy from 2004. Old, wow. yeah, it's, it's getting up there in yeah, age. Okay. Um, watch that. Uh, that one holds up really well. A lot of practical effects. There's some okay. CG, but mostly practical effects, which mm. Guillermo del Toro's like, he, he like Nolan actually, like Christopher yeah. Nolan, big fan of practical effects. Yeah. So that one aged really well. Ron Perlman's Hellboy is fantastic. So, hmm. um, and he enjoyed that. Not not a lot of you know super inappropriate stuff for him there. Um, you know more scary visuals which don't bother him. Like okay. he'd much rather see somebody you know's face melting rather than a long drawn out French kiss. So, uh, <laughs> wow. You know that that that's fine. <laughs> he, he was good there. Um, uh, which I learned after watching Lee Indiana, Indiana, Jones. Indiana Jones. Yeah, I was yeah. gonna say that sounds yep. very specific. Yeah. Um, and then uh, we went grocery shopping. It was a, uh, um, let's see, Archer had said he wanted to have sugar cookies because he had made those at um, okay. his summer camp. And I was like, yeah, that's fine. a good we, thing we, to make. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah. But we were at the grocery store and I saw a box of, you know, just a Betty Crocker you know, box of cake mix. And I said, do you want to make a cake instead? Because weeks ago he had said he wanted to try to make a cake one day. Okay. And he's like, yeah, absolutely. Yes. And I said, do you want to do it yourself? Yes, yes. All by myself. Yes, please. So I said, okay, pick out a cake, a box of cake mix and pick out some icing and eat right chocolate and chocolate. Nice. Uh, so when we got home, he, <laughs> he baked the cake 100% by himself. Wow. Um, the only thing I told him that he was getting a little skipping ahead of himself when he was reading the instructions on the back mm -hmm. and it said, add this much of water, this many cups of water, and then two tablespoons of water. And he missed the two tablespoons. Oh. So I told him like, actually, you know, there's, okay. read, read it fully. Yeah, that yeah. was the only thing I did. He huh. would not even let me get things out for him. He was wow. climbing on the counter. He's like, no, no, I want to do it. I want to do it. <laughs> and like, so I did nothing for him. Awesome. He insisted on doing everything. So he did it. Yeah, soup to nuts. Still. Can he come well, over to my house and make a cake for me? Holding himself, my kids yeah. ain't doing that. Yeah, so he was very <laughs> proud of himself. Covered the thing in sprinkles. We just happened to have had like way too many sprinkles. I think I told you about it. We, we went over What kind French. of sprinkles? Because this matters. Are they the waxy sprinkles or the little bald? We had both things. We had both. Both. Yeah. He, I, don't, he, I don't know what to do with that. He used both. He put the nonpareils in the middle, and then the waxy sprinkles around the edge, chocolate sprinkles around that. Oh my gosh! And then chocolate chips all along the edge of that. Whoa, that's intense. So when when you when you cut it and lifted it, you just heard like the sprinkles just, like falling, just falling off away. like a waterfall. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> but he is he was so proud of himself. Um, yeah, and didn't know if it's a box cake, man. It tasted delicious. Huh. So you know, no, no, yeah, no complaints that's there. Good for him, man. So that was that was definitely a thing. Um, um, my wife gave me a like a paired membership to her Spotify premium account. Okay, which I have not been listening to music for years. I've just it's yeah. Just you kinda said that you've been listening to not really a part of my life, but uh, CD audiobooks you get from the library. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So um, I've been listening to some music. Uh, okay. Getting back into What are you listening music. to? Yeah. Uh, well, I jumped into some, you know, uh, some 80s rock, listened to some, some Firehouse, listened to okay. a little bit of Metallica, listened to right. um, right. some, uh, uh, some some Synthwave, listened to some um, nice. Midnight. Uh, this channel called FM84. That's pretty okay. rad. All right. But I've also been listening to a lot of, oh, The Poodles, one of my favorite bands called The Poodles, oh. and then Sabaton. I listened to a lot of Sabaton. So that's the band that sings about military history. And they had one song on their one of their more recent albums that I had not witnessed because I have been just out of the game. Yeah. A song called Lady of the Dark. And it Sounds enticing. It's It was, you know, I, I don't understand everything he says, but sometimes I understand enough to want to go learn more about the song. So mm. in this song, he was singing about this woman uh, who I later learned, her name was Milunka Savic, and she mm. was from uh, Serbia uh, around World War I time. Basically, Serbian World War I Mulan, Brian. Huh. No joke. So 
she enlisted in the Serbian military under her brother's name. Oh. That back then only the women could only be nurses in the military. Mm. Enlisted under her brother's name. On only after her tenth deployment did they realize she wow. was a woman. Because wow. she got injured and went to the doctor, just like Mulan. Wow. And they're like, what? But tenth deployment, man. This was in World War One. She started in like, you know, one of the, you know, uh one a Serbian conflict. Okay. And then in World War One, she gets found out. Uh they're like, okay, this is not okay. You she was a, a corporal at that point. Like she had won wow. medals, she had won awards, she was legit. Gosh. She was like known as an expert grenade thrower, like insanely accurate. Uh, apparently captured Gosh. like a hundred soldiers single handedly. Like she was amazing. And then they were like, okay, I can't punish you because you're one of our best, Boss but also lady. you That's can't, awesome. you can't stay because you're a woman. So you can be a nurse. We'll let you be a nurse. She was like, nope, active duty only front lines. That's all I will accept. And they're like, well, you, yeah, you, you, you're, uh, uh, you're, I, I need to think about this. And she was like, I will wait. So she stood there at attention while her commanding officer went to talk to people, figure stuff out. They came back and they're like, okay, you can stay. <laughs> That's awesome. So she, I think to this day, is the most decorated, you know, female soldier of all time. Wow. Like, and I've never heard of her. She's basically Mulan, World War One. Wow. Amazing. Well, now you have heard of her because of Sabaton. How cool is that? That's epic. That blew me away. So, yeah, I always learn stuff from Sabaton. They're great. Very cool. Yeah. And uh, so it's some more patch on my jean jacket, keeping that keeping that going. And then uh, this weekend, so um, if you're hearing this on Friday, uh, tomorrow I will be going to uh, see Oppenheimer. With my brothers. Okay. It's my brother's birthday, my brother Chad, turning 30 mm. something, 38, 37. I don't know. Mm. Two years younger than me, whatever I am. You're 39. Um, yeah. So I don't <laughs> know. He's 30 something. Uh, so we're going to go see Oppenheimer, uh, okay. IMAX. Um, so get hopefully get the full thing. It's not, it's not one of the, there's only a few theaters that will actually show it in the exact ratio it was shot in. Right. But it's IMAX, so it's still better than nothing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we're going to go see that. And then... Or no, before that, the plan is to go to one of those hatchet throwing places and to throw some hatchets. I've never done that before. Have you? I've not done it officially <laughs> at a place. But you have thrown hatchets? I've thrown hatchets before. Into, just out like, of curiosity. Yeah? Did you get any into the tree? Uh, I don't remember. Assuming you're throwing them into I trees. Remember. I don't know if I was throwing them into trees. I might have thrown it into the ground or something. I don't know. Okay. It was like a couple of times I tried it. Yeah. It's... So it's hard. Yeah, I'm assuming I'm not <laughs> going to get any into the wall, but you know, we'll see. That's it's a it's yeah. a thing. So I'm actually going to do that tomorrow. Are you really? Not, I am. Yeah, yeah. For All the first right. Time. So I don't know what to expect. I've, the only thing I've seen is like fails on YouTube of people that like throw it and it bounces back. At yeah. Them. So I'm like, like you, apparently you get, respect the you you the get thing. the guy telling you what to do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I get the idea. Like you have to rotate have it many, a certain number yeah, of times. Yeah. yeah. Cause I'll do that. Like, you know, sometimes I'll do it not necessarily like with the intention of trying to hit a target, right. but if I'm like, you know, cutting trees down and stuff like that, you know, there'll be the stump that's left over and I'll have my little hatchet that I'll do. And sometimes I'll like throw it down right. like into the top of the stump that I just cut. So, so I'm like, like kind of used to like pretty then, far. Yeah, yeah. Not even really a rotation, not even a full rotation. Okay. So even that is like not as practiced for me, yeah. but you know, there's an art to it. Okay. I'm curious. All right. So next text time, next pen cast, you will hear next how we'll both have thrown hatchets. Yeah. That's interesting. What the heck? Hatchet battle. That's wild. It yeah. doesn't seem like something that we would have aligned with. It is really random that we both happen yeah. to be throwing hatchets. Oh, Bizarre. All I'll right. Let you, I'll let well, you know more on that as it develops, I suppose. What do you yeah. have going on? Or what have you had going on? What have I had going on? Okay, are you ready to get tired? Because oh, God. I told you I'm going to be... You haven't been busy, have you? I've been busy enough. <laughs> no, but I make myself busy. <laughs> exactly. Um, so my half day off, I uh, Ellie had one of these flim flim floozy, you know, assemble yourself furniture oh. kind of a thing. And it broke because ah. it's made of sawdust, basically, with glue. Um, yeah, it just broke, you know, the head, like whatever it was, it was like one of those just s simple, like a frame shoe rack kind of things. Yeah. Um, and so she's, you know, shoes and socks around our house are like, it's like when you go to the beach and there's sand and it ends up getting everywhere. Uh, That's our house with like shoes and, shoes socks. and socks. They're just everywhere. So it was like, okay. Well, let's let's fix your shoe rack so at least there's somewhat of an attempt to put them. So when you tell place. tell her to put it away, <clears throat> she can't say I can't. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> we have like, it's funny. We have this like, one of those little like uh, 
plastic like milk crate type things you know you can yeah. like, hang files on it you know the kind of thing you get like in college college or sure. whatever like they have them at target sometimes we have like one of those that we had for like the kids when their shoes were really tiny but we never like upgraded it and it's to the point now where there's like three the shoes. whole family's shoes in oh there my God. and it's like overflowing with shoes like there's no prayer that the shoes could possibly fit into this thing anymore hopeless but we've just never like come up with a better plan and i I mention it to Rachel all the time, I'm like these freaking shoes, but then I never do anything about it's it. It's a so battle it's just... at my house. I come in and there's in our in our closet downstairs there are coats and there's one hanging shoe floppy thing. Oh yeah, yeah. One the one top two, the, the top yeah. two are where I put my Chuck Taylors. I have a green pair and I have an orange pair. Okay, those stay downstairs in those two top slots. Everything else, every day, I take upstairs, put them in my closet on a shelf. Wow. None of my shoes are on the floor ever. I have a pair of slippers on the floor behind okay. my bookshelf in the office. That's it. Okay. Shannon and Archer, total chaos <laughs> everywhere. And then beneath my, the two places I, I was like, guys, I just want these two spots. That's all I care about. You're, you have everything you have else. everything else, yeah. Some of those are empty. Everything else on the floor, yep. right in the closet. It's about my, my Got house. socks in the hallway. And then, you know, yep. and Shannon and Archer just think that the, the, the dining room table, it's like benches. We have benches on. Yeah, it's, like, okay. it's one of those things okay. where it's chairs on the side, benches. Mm -hmm. on the other sides. That's just where shoes need to go, yeah. apparently. Seems like the right spot. I'm, it's your turn, you talk. I'm. <laughs> I feel your pain on that one. I'm also part of the problem in my house. Not me. No one in my house makes any effort to make that any better, so it's you can imagine. I do, but I should probably stop because that's upsetting <laughs> me. <laughs> um, okay, so anyway, so Ellie needed another shoe rack, and I was like, well, we could build a shoe rack. And it was like, oh, it's a project we can do together. And then Hey, look, like, I already have one. It oh, looks kind of like, like a bench, but right. you know. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, so I basically ended up building kind of the same thing that she did, but it's like actually out of, you know, more solid wood yes. and stuff like that. So not sawdust, um, not sawdust. Yeah. So should hold up better. Um, and then, so that was what I did with my time off. And then I'm working on some like more wooden backdrops because a lot of the things that the photo guys will like take pictures on. Oh yeah. It's like wood that I've like made for them to do like real wood. Yeah. You know, we stuff. use so some of those in Fountain Pen 101. Up, yeah. I'm gonna make up some more Part of those. So I'm, so I'm doing up some more of those for fun. Um, but the big thing that I did on Saturday was um, I did some landscape type stuff for my sister. Um, so she's like, you know, her kids are slightly younger. She's in the middle of writing a book. She has a company. Her husband's got another company. They're super busy. Yeah, you were talking so, last week about how you yeah, just got, said like, like this, hey, send me a list. Yeah, I was like, I'll just give I, me a punch list and I'll, I'll do like, some stuff. just come over and knock some stuff yeah. out. So I, like I had Saturday wide open. I was like, let me just come in the morning and I, you know, there's a couple of things I can probably knock out. So I brought like my truck with the trailer behind it. So I like, I got a lot of hauling capacity. Oh my gosh. And so I was like, okay, so they've, you know, they, they had an old grill, right? They, live, they had an old grill. Yeah. They had, you know, all kinds of just stuff that toys that the kids had outgrown and planter boxes where the plants had died and the boxes kind of broke. And so they just, they just needed a lot of help getting rid of yeah. stuff. They don't have a truck. They don't have any of that kind of stuff. So I was like, cool, I'll just load it all up. Wow. But they had this, my sister had like done this whole like garden area, but it was all overgrown. She can't maintain it anymore. So she needed all that stripped out, you know, had tons of just, they've got these big oak trees and tons of like branches and acorns and all that kind of junk. So they just needed a lot of help getting just organic matter out of their backyard because yeah. they live in the neighborhood and it's like all fenced in, but like all the just junk that falls in there from these massive trees just all ends up there and they don't really have a good way to get it out of there. And it's just years and years of this have piled up. So I did that and Wow. Didn't really look at the forecast. I thought, it, you know, there's like a chance of rain oh and stuff like that. Gosh. But Saturday was, I don't know, 4,000% humidity. Oh, yes. It was so hot. It was terrible. And wet. It was. And it poured. It didn't really rain that much. Oh, we um, got some bad. You got some? Oh, it was very yeah. isolated. We got a little bit, but not, not for yeah. long. So I went there at like 10 o'clock in the morning. And I was like, I'll probably be here, you know, for a little bit. The kids had like a birthday party thing at a pool for one of their friends at oh, one o'clock. And I was like, oh, maybe I'll be done by one. Oh. I wasn't planning on staying there all that long, but I just like was making such good progress as I was going that I just kind of went- Having time, too much fun. Just kind of went time blind. Oh my God, I hadn't Brian. brought lunch. I hadn't like done any of that, you know, but- Brian! I just, I mean, I was at my sister's house, so she like, you know, fed me okay. some stuff and stuff like that. I mean, so that's I was the like, least she could do. I wasn't like, super that's worried a, about it. Yeah, she, she, and this was solid. under no pressure from her. That's she super was like, felt bad, though. and I was like, no, I like want to do this. Man. So I ended up staying under until 6.30. <laughs> When'd you get there? 10 o'clock. Oh my God. And I I really hardly took a And you didn't eat anything? Um, I ended up eating like a biscuit and an apple. But I had eaten breakfast right before I went over. And, but... 
what I want to say is like, I'm normally a pretty big water drinker as it is. Just I'm a thirsty, sweaty person. But first off, when I landscape and stuff like that outside, again, the whole poison ivy thing, I have to wear like pants and long sleeves. So I'm already like full pants and long sleeves. Oh and it's like, it was what, like 94, 95 degrees? But the humidity, the humidity was, was like, so intense. You're like swimming out there. <laughs> yeah, I was out there all day. I drank over three gallons of water. What? While I was working there. Oh my God. It got to the point where I, like after I was done for the day, I was like, I'm so sick of water. <laughs> I need something else to drink. Were you were you like squishing in your shoes? I was completely soaked through. Oh my God. I, the leather belt that I was wearing over top of all my layers of clothes was completely soaked through with sweat. I thought you were gonna tell me you didn't drink any water. At least oh, you no, no, drank, no. yeah. I drank water. That's that's like, good, at least you did I, that. I had, a, I had a 64 ounce like insulated tumbler Jeez. and I filled that thing six, filled it and killed it six times. Oh my God. And then I had this thing, drank that once and then had some more. So I drank a lot of water. And then I, I was curious because I was like, I drank a ton of water. It's like 25 pounds of water. Oh my God. And I weighed myself afterwards and I weighed the exact same. So I drank and sweat out 25 pounds of water. I would say that's efficient hydration, <laughs> sir. Yeah. Uh, I was a little sore that yeah. night into the next day though. Oh but I mean, I literally filled, I have, a, I have a 10 foot by five foot trailer and I have a pickup truck with an eight foot bed. And I had them... Beverly Hillbills, Billy style, filled and like wrapped and tarped and strapped down and everything. And I hauled all that out of there. So I was, it was a lot of crap that I moved, but she was thrilled. Um, it looked so much better afterwards and it just felt great to do that for her. And I was just like, you know, I was moving my body. It was like- You are a good dude, Brian it's like a It's like a real life sauna, just like sweating it all out, you know? But yeah, so that was fun. She, your friend, your, your sister is greatly <laughs> benefiting from your. She's, oh, she's very your, grateful. You're your completely, your 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 uh, productivity handicap or whatever you want to call it. Well, your, it's like yeah, it's like that. I want to put my powers for good. Your you know detrimental I mean? proactivity. I don't <laughs> That's know. Right. Self. Self. Whatever you want to call it. Deprecating whatever. Self. Masochistic. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yes. relaxing activities. Wow. Man, so, yeah, oh, man, that was, oh, man. And it was like, it was to the point where like, I worked myself so hard. And this is just by my own choice, worked myself so hard. It like, it, it was like, there were only a few times that I remember being that tired, that sweaty, that worn out. It's like when I've done like century bike rides, like hundred mile bike rides, that's when I felt that tired. I felt like I'd like run a marathon basically. Or like when I was in like new cadet week in like the core of cadets and just like, marching all day and sweating like crazy it was like felt that like that same feeling so except this it time like, it was for fun it was for fun and by choice well all of those were by choice but yeah so anyway that's what i do in my downtime um and then my whole sunday basically was scripting out part five of our fountain pen 101 which is like the capstone so we got part four i think that we're publishing this week and then part five so there there i was like let my body rest put my brain to work and made that happen so that was fun um and i will say part five i think it's it's basically like how to write with a fountain pen i think of all the videos we've done so far that'll be the one for our audience here on the pencast they'll probably benefit the most like there'll be the most somewhat new information on yeah that. up until now they've been pretty elementary which yeah. anybody listening to this probably yeah. and has it's fountain pen 101 so it's meant to be you know yeah. more accessible information anyway but I think even if you use a lot of fountain pens, you probably aren't familiar with like posture and like holding the pen and why and the muscles in your hand and all this type of stuff. I get into all that. So cool. it should be pretty fun and interesting. Maybe I'll watch it. You can, you might learn something. <gasps> yeah. Um, and then last but not least, had to, had to put down my old washing machine. It was very sad. We've, you know, gotten some good times together. Um, no, honestly, what it was is like, there's been this like, grinding noise that's been happening in our washing machine whenever it's it was a it was a top loader with the like agitator and every time that agitator turned it was like grr, grr. so it felt like you know some parts were wearing out Wait, not not with like one of those like central agitators that go up the middle right well it's it's like a shorter version of that so it's it's but yeah it's the it's the thing that turns in the middle yeah but it's on the it's like it's it, on the bottom, yeah. Right. Oh, okay. The yeah, old yeah. school washers had like a big tube. That, that's that what came I thought you were describing. Up. Okay, no, no, it's no. that same part, but it's just right, right, right. much flatter. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, you yeah can of fit course. More okay, stuff. okay. But it's still it's that thing spins yeah. back and forth. Yeah. But every time that part was spinning, it was making this really loud kind of grinding. It's probably noise. sawdust and wood chips and metal shavings. <laughs> well, so it's like okay, so when it <laughs> when it comes to I like fixing stuff. I'm good with tools, but when it comes to appliances and stuff like that i'm like 
you know, my dad always taught me like, just always give it a look, see, because it's like, you never know. It might be something simple. There could be a screw loose. Just even if you don't know what you're dealing with, just take it apart in a way that you can't undo it, you know, and then, and then at least see what's going on. Cause I've had that happen before where there's like, your 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 whatever your washing machine's making a weird noise and you're like oh there's like a there's a, a little piece of wire that's stuck in there and you pull it out and it works perfectly fine, yeah. but I started doing this and watching videos and stuff like that and it sounded like the clutch like in the motor thing and I watched some YouTube videos and it's like oh here's how you replace that part, and you gotta like disassemble the whole thing and that part was like three hundred dollars to replace and all that and I was like this is an eleven year old washer and it's just like I don't want to have to buy a new washer but also it's an expensive part to replace, even to do it myself. If that's even the problem, yeah. I don't really know fully how to diagnose that. An 11 that. year so old is something's gonna it. go wrong with it a couple well, months and later. Well, and it's a top loader and Rachel's like, she has a hard time reaching in to get to the bottom of it. So she really wanted a front loader. And so I was just like, but then I was like, okay, let me let me go ahead and try. So I spent like a couple hours trying to fix this thing. Um, this was later on Friday after this was part of my mental health thing too. <laughs> I was like, let me fix my washing machine. Leading um, by bad example, Brian. But here's the problem. This is a little PSA for everybody. Um, we have never done a tub clean on our washing machine. I didn't even know that that was a thing. I've never done it. So there you go. Well, um, so we had 11 years of never having like done any like specific cleaning action or cleaning cycle. What are you supposed cycle. to do? There's like, on, at least on our washer and probably most of them, there's like a tub cleaning option oh, that oh. you run without clothes in there mm. and it cleans all the grime that builds up in your washing machine okay. over time and we'd notice kind of a funky smell over time yeah it's happened especially like on our towels and stuff and it's like oh, that's kind of weird but we don't use like scented you know cleaner and stuff because again my skin sensitivities and stuff so we use like fragrance free stuff and so i was like maybe it's just that but once i opened up this washing machine and i saw what was in there i was like oh my gosh Time for a new washing machine. It was kind of like, well, I was like starting to clean some of the parts out, but it was like the whole drum. Like I pulled the drum out and the the part of the drum that you don't see, like on the back of it, I was like, this is horrifying. And I was like, it's like 11 years of not having. And then I, I opened up the instruction, like the owner's manual for the washing machine. And was like, we were recommend doing a tub clean monthly or whatever. And I was like, uh, okay, I've got a hundred and oh. 30 months worth of oh, neglect man. on this. Okay, ours are relatively new, so I need I, I need to start doing Look that. Look up the tub clean thing. Apparently okay. there's like a there's like a tub cleaning kind of agent that you can use specifically for that purpose. Okay. But yeah, so I was like, okay, so I'm in like a full deconstruct and clean out and mm -hmm. replacing a part and all that. And honestly, it was like, it was also, we had just gotten back from the beach. So we had all our clothes with the sand and all that garbage. Uh. And it was like, I'm not putting my clothes back in this washing machine unless we clean this thing out. And it just reached a point where I'd invested so many hours and I was like, I hate to throw out something that potentially could be fixed. No, like they're only replaced, supposed to only last like, like 10 years anyway. And I have my I have my limits. So I was like, okay, I hate to do it, but yeah. I gotta get rid of this yeah, thing. Yeah, get rid of that so thing. I was a little sad, weirdly, to get rid of my old washing machine because it wasn't broken. Oh, come like on. it wasn't non-functional, but once I saw <laughs> the cleaning on it. I was yeah. like, oh my gosh, this is terrible. Yeah. So I'd already invested like four hours into it at that point. Mm -hmm. I was like, all right, calling it. Nah. So now we have a new washing machine and Great. it runs a lot better and I'm going to do a tub clean on it now. Yeah. Because, what brand did you get? Uh, we have an LG. LG, I think we went That's what with, we had before. Was, we had Samsung before. I think we went with LG yeah. this, this time. I the song the, isn't as cool as the Samsung song, but it's all right. Yeah. It's not bad. Okay, fair enough. Did you get a front loading one? We did get a front. Did you research one. those? Because I've heard front loading ones can be like mildew we, prone. We had a front loader prior to the last yeah. one that we had, and it had like moldy issues and yeah. stuff like that. So we got away from it, and then Rachel wanted to go back to it. And Are I'm they like, better okay. now? I don't know. Uh, well, let me know. We'll find out. <laughs> That's I'm going to do we... a lot of tub cleans on. It, I can yeah. tell you that much. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a kind of thing. Like it, it kind of depends. But yeah. um, whenever it comes to appliances, I've had pretty good luck. There's a site called The Wire Cutter. Mm. This is recommended to me by you know one of my friends. That, mm -hmm is just nerdy about that kind of stuff and knows all the things to research. Um, and that's like, we had no affiliation with them obviously, but um, I've had pretty good luck with like vacuums and refrigerators and like stuff like that yeah. because they review them and it's, it's, it's pretty solid. So I always look at that as a good resource and we ended up, that ended up being like the good choice. These us. days, it's so hard to find a good review site. Because yeah. there's so, all, so many of them are like, oh, so just like AI, AI written, pulled, yeah, you know, nonsense. Yeah. And they're, they all yeah. look the same. That one, that one's good. That one's pretty good. Yeah, I mean, I it, was just, bought, like, it was bought out a few years ago by the New York Times. 
So it's like, okay, is it still going to yeah. be, you know, kind of the thing? But I've had good luck with them up to this point, so I'll keep doing it. That's awesome. That's yeah. good. That's good to hear. I'll pretty keep, thorough. I'll yeah. keep that in mind. These days, yeah. I'm on YouTube, and if I want to look at a review for something, like, I want to just see a human being. Yeah. Like, I don't even care if it's, you know, a crappy camera or whatever. I want to see a human being who's holding the product in their hand. You don't want an AI-generated British voice mm. reading some I don't want just product description. Graphics or... moving across <laughs> with, like, you know, a voiceover. Like, no, I want to see a human being who has the thing yeah. that I'm curious yeah. about yeah and it's it seems fewer it's and further between it's hard it's man hard. yep anyway so yeah oh but the one thing that i we are going to do this is not really relevant i won't spend a lot of time on it but the problem with the front loader is it's like on the floor like we like basically oh, have to get down on our knees yeah you need to like a it, riser so we need to rise it up but this particular washer the only oh my god riser thing oh, they have oh boy here we go well the only riser thing they have is like an extra washing machine I don't know where this trend is started, but it's like a it's like a half washing machine. So it's like it's stackable or whatever the heck it is. Right. But it's another small washing machine under there. Oh. That you I, can do like a small half load. But it's like six hundred dollars. Oh no, I've seen like they make like drawers you can put them on. Like Yeah. Uh, but the one for this washing machine really is the only option that I was able to find. Was what? Buying another washing machine to stick under there. And I was like, no way in heck do I want another make something? smaller, more complicated. So I didn't think I'm going yeah. to end up building yes. something to, because we got that and our dryer. And I'm like, well, you know, let's raise them both I'm up. I'm sure that Ikea and makes something you can put under them both. I like, don't with trust little, Ikea. With drawers. To hold a washing machine? That's got to be Wood strong. Wood glue, man. Wood nah, glue. this is beyond that. <laughs> This needs some like goulet design from the ground up. Oh my god! We need. It's going to be mostly. It's going to weigh the same it's gonna be weight. Mostly nails and screws. Yes. Held together with glue, <laughs> with some small bits of wood in between. Oh my god! No, but I'm thinking what I'm going to do is I'm going to incorporate some shoe storage. So I'm going to build a whole oh. platform that lifts up because it's like that's like right off our garage. So the kids kick off the shoes and you end up with like the washer and the dryer and the there's two doors in this tiny little room. It's right off our kitchen between mm -hmm. our garage. And it's just friggin' doors everywhere. <laughs> and you throw shoes in there and it's like a friggin' like death march going into your kitchen. So I'm like, no, we're gonna, I'm gonna lift them up, shove some shoes under there, and we'll call it a day. All so right. that'll be my next project is elevating my washer and dryer to store shoes. This is my life. Best of luck anyway, to you, my friend. That's what I got, thank you. All right. All right, we got a quick company update and then we'll wrap this sucker up. All right, we have some stuff on the horizon here. We are gonna be, not yet, but we have a pen cleaning and tuning sale that we're looking to do um, starting next week. So be on the lookout for that. And we have- Will that be announced by Friday? It will be announced. We literally just this morning, as I recorded this, we'd moved the date on that. Okay. So I'm giving you a heads up, not giving you any specifics because we may still change it because we have some things that we've been waiting on restocking and stuff like that, but mm. it'll be forthcoming. So be on the lookout for that. Also be on the lookout for um, a potential new product. We might, yeah. And I will say we are, I'm pretty sure this is fairly locked in, but we're looking to do a shark pen sale next week too. Probably just on Tuesday. That's the plan at the moment, but it's shark week next week apparently. So we'll do a little shark pen sale. Um, and then uh, let's see here. We uh, will have published the Fountain Pen 101 part four, focusing on nibs uh, for this week. So Fountain Pen 101 is a five part series. This is part four of five. We've recorded part five. That'll be the next one coming out. And then the series will be complete. I'm very excited about that. Until next 10 years. Yep. Next decade, you'll see me and I'll have no hair by that point. Oh, and, uh, you'll uh, have. No, I'll be like yeah. Anderson Cooper, like yeah. Silver Fox by then. I'm excited for that. And I will. I want to go gray. And I will look like I'm an excited. emaciated Hulk Hogan. <laughs> That's pretty good. You might. I could see your your body frame would probably be more like a um, oh, what's his name? Like a Randy Quaid. I'm picturing. No, Randy Quaid. Know? No, he's got like he's a big dude. Is he? Oh yeah, he's a okay. big dude. Massive beard now too. He's kind of insane. Oh, I mean, he's always been a little out there. No, I'm more of like a probably John Malkovich. Sort oh yeah, of okay. Looking guy. I can yeah. See that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Fair enough. Cool. Not All supposed right. to agree with that, Brian, but thank you. I mean. You put it out there. You should have been like, no, I see you more of a John Hamm, Matthew McConaughey, you know. Oh, you're dreaming. <laughs> I'm not even gonna, I'm not even gonna lead you down that road. <laughs> uh, Jim Carrey, good I've, friend. I've always viewed your your doppelganger. He doesn't. He doesn't look. No, doppel doppelganger. He doesn't. He doesn't look bad. He doesn't He's look aged bad. well. Yeah. He looks yeah. Good. Heck yeah. Good looking. Yeah. Guy. Very animated yeah. as well. Um. All right. Cool. Well. 
let's wrap this thing up. I want to thank you all for watching. Please leave us some feedback. Let us know how we're doing. Ask us questions and all the things. Check out gouletpens.com for ink paper needs and all that stuff. And I got a fun fact for you. Actually related to pens. So Ooh. as I was researching my last Fountain Pen 101 video, this is a paper fact that I discovered that it was kind of new. So it's slightly obscure because it's like, I already knew a lot about paper, but I learned this. So it's about paper weight. So, you know, like the grams per square meter, yeah. 80 gram paper, that sure, kind of sure. thing that we talk about. Um, well, I know that that's not, that's the, that's like the global standard is the metric like paper weight. But if you buy like, especially copy paper here in the US, it's like 20 pound, 24 pound. Yeah. And I'm like, what is that pound? I have no idea. What does that mean? And it just, I've never cared enough to like really research it. So I did. And so I found out what it actually means. So anyway, the 80 gram, like Rhodia paper is 80 gram. That measurement is if you take one square meter of that paper and weigh it, it weighs 80 grams. GSM grams per square meter or G2M grams per square meter or GM2 or whatever. So, okay, cool. Pretty straightforward. It's not that straightforward in the US situation. Why would it be? Because it has to make no sense whatsoever. It's gotta have that crazy wacky yeah. so, little imperial system. Yeah, so I, in the fountain pen world, pretty much everything is gram weight. Like it's, there's nothing imperial Makes about sense. any of the stuff that we yeah. sell. But just in case you're curious, in the US, the weight that we see on things like copy paper, it's called the bond weight, right? That's what it's known as. Um, so that's what you see in most of the consumer products uh, for paper in the US. Um, but a lot of it is like very industry driven. So it's pretty much like from the paper mills or like the, the paper like raw material supplier to the paper mills. And then like maybe mills to like the graphic houses or the printers. That's where all the lingo comes from. And then it's like consumer products is like whatever. You guys just have to friggin figure it out. So they just call it like 24 pound. And you're like, I don't know, 24 pound is, must be not as thick as 28 pound or whatever. But you're like, what does this pound even mean? So the bond weight is defined as the pound weight of 500 sheets of 17 by 22 inch paper. That's what it is. 17 by 22. So if you take a 17 by 22, 500 sheets of it, a ream basically, weigh that, that's your weight. 17 by 22. And I thought that was kind of random. And then I was like, you know what? If you take that, divide it by half long ways. And then eight and a half, half by way, 11. You get four, eight and a half by 11. Oh. So I'm thinking like, okay, so when they're doing like textbooks and legal pads and like that kind of stuff, they're probably starting with those bigger sheets. Oh. That's the bond weight. And so they just say 24 pound. Okay. And then they cut it into eight and a half by 11. But if you think about it, if you're making text, like if you're making books, you might make it you know, in like a double sheet and then you fold it over sure. or something like so that. They might so, just be cutting it in half. So there's probably something there. I didn't research it any deeper than that, but that's what the pound weight refers to is a ream of 17 by 22. 17 by 22. Weird. And that's so essentially, and I could go way more into like the weight of paper. It, it's not actually the thickness because you get into like sizing and clay coating and like all this yeah, type of stuff. Yeah. It's essentially like paper density. Yeah. Anyway, huh. um, so then there was one other little thing. There's another thing called cover weight, which is another thing that's used out there. I think that's more of a graphic art kind of like printing term, but that's 500 sheets of 20 by 26. So that that's another like pound weight that's just never, different than bond weight. Never heard that one. I don't one. Friggin know anything about that, but it's, you know, it's kind of interesting. So I was like, okay, well now I know why copy paper is called pound whatever. So if it's the logic of like yeah. more poundage means thicker, heavier, whatever, Usually. better, better quality-ish yeah. paper. But all of paper is incredibly confusing. I feel no better about it after having researched it. Now, <laughs> but at least now I somewhat understand of maybe where it came from, but there you go. All right, little that's, fun fact. that's new to me. 14 years of doing this, and even I learned something new as I'm researching a video for basic knowledge, go figure. The best way to learn is to teach, right? There we go. That's what they say. And that will conclude bringing up the average on our pen cast time yeah, wow. here. So hope you all enjoy. Well it. over two hours. Yep. I got a nice swamp <laughs> that, situation all right, that's going enough. on over okay, here. That's and we'll see you next time. Thank hammock. you so much for watching and right on.